He's fearless. He's eccentric. He's dedicated to the SCP Foundation's cause. In a lot of ways, he's even more like a living legend than a regular Foundation employee. His face, voice, gender, and even species may sometimes change, but it's impossible to miss that ornate medallion resting against his chest. That's right, today we're talking about the infamous Dr. Bright. Can you think of many other researchers who've been cross-tested with the dreaded SCP-682 and live to tell the tale? Of course, there's a special advantage Dr. Bright possesses that most researchers don't. It's the medallion he's never seen without, and because of it, Dr. Bright can't die. How is that possible, you ask? Because in a sense, he is that medallion. Don't worry. After this crash course in all things Dr. Bright, including his origin, his present, and his future, you'll be a lot less confused. So, who is Dr. Jack Bright? For starters, he's a decorated researcher of anomalies for the SCP Foundation, and unlike most other researchers, he's uniquely qualified for the job on the grounds that he himself is an anomaly. Just don't bring this up when you're talking to him. It's kind of a sore subject. Beyond that, who or even what Dr. Bright is can be a bit of a loaded question, with an answer that depends on who and when you ask. What we're presenting to you here is one of the more popular versions of the Dr. Bright story, and the one most closely adhered to by Dr. Bright himself these days. One of our biggest challenges to understanding Dr. Bright is that he has been so prolific in his exploits and achievements within the Foundation, that when telling his story it's hard to know where to start. But as the saying goes, let's begin at the beginning. Starting with the Bright family. Bright was a name that carried a lot of weight around the Foundation even before Jack Bright signed up for service. His parents, Dr. Adam and Evelyn Bright, were both Foundation personnel. His siblings were incredibly numerous, and the ones we are aware of are TJ Bright, Michael Bright, Claire Pierce, and a nameless sister now known only as SCP-321. Sadly, you'll soon see that the story of the Bright family is one of consistent tragedy and strife. While the anomalization of Dr. Bright took hold a little later on in his life, his brother TJ was born anomalous and was designated as SCP-590. TJ had the ability to heal any ailment with a touch, with the cost being that he took on those ailments himself. He's now used as a tool for healing at the Foundation, and he's consistently bedridden with the illnesses he takes on. Dr. Bright induced a mental state similar to that of a three-year-old in TJ, likely in hopes of reducing the mental burden placed on his poor brother. And sadly, that burden goes far beyond healing the illnesses of strangers. When Adam and Evelyn experienced a tragic stillbirth, they desperately tried to get TJ to help. TJ did manage to save her, partially, but the result wasn't human, and both he and the daughter which came to be known as SCP-321, were taken into Foundation custody. SCP-321 was a highly regenerative and stretched out abomination that seemed to keep growing with age. But Adam still saw it as his daughter and spent the rest of his life trying to negotiate her freedom from the Foundation. When his request was denied as a researcher, he climbed the ranks to personnel director. When his request was denied there, he became a site director and then a member of the O5 Council all with the intention of getting his daughter back. But that never happened, and the rest of the council had him assassinated for his trouble. There's no reward for sentimentality at the Foundation. The other two Bright siblings are believed to be polar opposites. Michael Bright is one of the Foundation's best field agents, known to some as Agent Cowboy. His dedication to the cause and incredible aptitude at his job has led some to speculate that he may even be on the O5 Council already. Claire Pierce, on the other hand, disagrees with the actions of the Foundation on a fundamental level, which is understandable given the horrific things they've done to the Bright family. She defected and became a member of the Serpent's Hand, a fringe group dedicated to blowing the lid on SCP Foundation secrets. This brings us to the man himself, Dr. Bright, the most well-known member of this sprawling family. Much like most of the rest of his family, he too entered the employment of the SCP Foundation. He was a junior researcher and a relatively unremarkable one, until his fateful run-in with a certain necklace labeled SCP-963. But what is SCP-963, and how exactly did Dr. Bright come into contact with it? 
It all started in a small apartment that was raided by the Foundation due to supposed occult activities. There they found a single body, cause of death apparently from suicide, clutching the medallion that would later be designated as SCP-963. The walls in the apartment were covered in ritualistic supernatural symbols, and a number of occult books were also found near the deceased man's body. The Foundation gathered that the man was attempting to perform some kind of magical ritual, but had apparently failed leading to his own demise. The Foundation soon learned that the recovered medallion appeared to be utterly indestructible, and they placed it under the care of a junior researcher, one Dr. Jack Bright. Dr. Bright studied the medallion for years, with very little to show for it, until one fateful day when he was tasked with transporting the medallion to a different area of the containment facility. While Dr. Bright was carrying out his simple transport task, he made a simple decision that changed the entire course of his life forever. He held the medallion in his bare hand. He also happened to be walking past the containment chamber of SCP-076-2, aka Abel, just as a containment breach was about to occur. Abel is an immortal, hyper-violent warrior who can summon blades out of interdimensional portals. Dr. Bright, following in the tradition of the Bright family bad luck, happened to be right in the path of Abel's rampage. The ensuing battle between Abel and the assembled mobile task forces and guards resulted in the destruction of the entire wing of the facility, and Dr. Bright was cut down in the brawl by the warrior's supernatural blades. It seemed like the story of Dr. Bright was short and simple, cut down in his prime in the line of duty. But a few days later, as several members of D-Class personnel were cleaning up the mess caused by the containment breach, one unlucky D-Class, known as D-1-113, happened upon the medallion that Dr. Bright had been holding when he died. He leaned over and picked it up, and instantly underwent a sudden and drastic change in personality. D-1-113 was now insisting that he was Dr. Bright, and since this D-Class had no reason to even know of the recently deceased researcher's existence, he was immediately brought in for an interview. After a brief evaluation, it seemed clear that somehow this D-Class really did have the exact mind of Jack Bright. But how? Well, after some experimentation, including from Dr. Bright himself, they found the answer. The medallion's purpose was to act as a kind of vessel for the consciousness of the person killed holding it. Its original creator had hoped to use it as a way to attain immortality, and took his own life in order to complete the ritual. This was a mistake, though. The correct way to complete the ritual was being killed by someone else while holding the medallion, something that had happened to Dr. Bright by total accident. In a sense, he'd been given a second chance at life, but this came with some anomalous side effects. As it turns out, Coming into direct contact with the necklace, now known as SCP-963-1, is a death sentence. It causes your mind to be totally wiped and replaced with that of Dr. Bright. If the necklace is then removed, you become a lifeless husk until the necklace is placed back onto you. If the medallion remains in contact with its host for a period of 30 days, Dr. Bright's consciousness becomes permanently bonded to the body without any contact from the medallion. If the medallion then comes into contact with someone else, even if a permanent version of Dr. Bright is already inhabiting another body, they too will be infused with his consciousness. That means that if Dr. Bright wanted to, he could have multiple versions of himself existing at once. Initially, the anomaly that Dr. Bright had become was treated with suspicion and fear by the Foundation. They were dealing with an intelligent and now immortal consciousness capable of replicating an unlimited number of times. In theory, he could even place his consciousness into dangerous SCPs and gain even more power. Dr. Bright was placed under strict rules, like not being able to interact with certain anomalies, and having his hosts killed and switched at 30-day intervals to prevent him from building replicas of himself. However, this caution proved to be misplaced. Dr. Bright was an extremely intelligent, loyal, and devoted researcher for the Foundation, and as a result, his restrictions were slowly lifted by the O5 Council. Much like his father before him, Dr. Bright rose through the ranks, becoming both a celebrated researcher and a director of various sites during different periods of time. While this may seem like a win-win scenario for all involved, this is a slightly more complex situation for Dr. Bright himself. In a routine psychological evaluation led by Dr. Simon Glass, 
Dr. Bright shared feelings of frustration about his current situation. He felt as though he was treated differently compared to the other researchers and given less trust due to a situation he didn't choose to be in. But for Dr. Bright, the psychological effects of having been fused to SCP-963-1 actually extends far beyond workplace frustrations and the boredom and sadness of unasked for immortality. In a conversation with Level 1 researcher Dr. Friedrich Hayden, Bright told him that, in a sense, he truly was the heart of the Foundation rather than just one small part in it. When asked to elaborate, he said that because of the gift and curse of immortality, he would go on to outlive all the other human operatives working for the SCP Foundation. He would remain with the organization for generations to come, perhaps centuries even and in that sense would be the one constant from now until the Foundation meets its end. When all else is gone, only Dr. Bright will remain. Of course, this is just an overview, and we've only just scratched the surface of Dr. Bright's actions and activities across the SCP Foundation multiverse. But for now, all you need to know is that Dr. Bright is still out there, and he'll be carrying that doomed name long after everyone else with it has fallen. Whether that's a good or bad thing is up to you to decide. When a hyper-aggressive lizard or an evil living cow heart starts rampaging through your town, or a sinister salesman turns up in your home, who are you gonna call? Hint, it's not the Ghostbusters. The answer is the SCP Foundation's Mobile Task Force. You've probably heard them mentioned in every single video on this channel, but what exactly is a Mobile Task Force? What do they do for the SCP Foundation? And what are some of the most famous Mobile Task Forces in the field? Let's crack open the files and take a look. In short, Mobile Task Forces are the Foundation's elite personnel, and each task force is generally made up of highly trained Foundation operatives with specific skill sets. These MTS aren't rooted in any one base and are relocated to wherever they're required, hence the mobile part of the name. The exact parameters on what an MTF can be is pretty flexible. The size of their units can vary from whole battalions of troops packing heavy artillery to small, tight-knit groups of intelligence-gathering spies. Some mobile task forces are bound to specific SCPs, whereas others perform more generalized tasks, such as securing certain facilities or territories. When the regular rank-and-file Foundation field agents can't do the job, the MTFs are brought in to pick up the pieces. Each group is controlled by a mobile task force commander, who reports to the Foundation director of task forces, though the actual organizational structure of each group varies. Sometimes MTFs, which were created for extremely specific purposes, are disbanded after that purpose is achieved. How many mobile task forces are there exactly? The exact number is shrouded in secrecy, and oftentimes the answer will depend on who you ask. But you're not here for what we don't know. You want to know the details on the biggest badasses under the Foundation's employ, and we intend to deliver. Much like our video on the proposals for SCP-001, we're going to give you a rapid-fire crash course on some of the most prominent and interesting Foundation task forces. And remember, if you want us to go more in-depth into the most exciting missions of any of these groups, let us know in the comments. But for now, it's time for a rundown of the Foundation's best of the best. MTF Alpha-1, aka Red Right Hand, are essentially the black ops of the SCP Foundation. They report directly to the O5 Council and conduct missions at the highest level of secrecy, with most of the information hidden behind a level 5 clearance wall. Many also believe Alpha-1 to have links to the infamous Chaos Insurgency, a splinter group at war with the Foundation. But if anyone asks, you didn't hear it from us. Seriously, we don't want to get assassinated. MTF Alpha 4, aka Pony Express, are a covert group deeply embedded into the world's logistics and postal services. The trafficking of anomalous objects is a worldwide issue, and it's up to Alpha 4 to intercept and keep a lid on those anomalous objects before they fall into the wrong hands. Think of them as a better funded paranormal USPS police division. One object they've prevented from reaching the public is SCP-3060, a series of CPAP machines that cause nighttime visions of frightening entities. MTF Omega-7, aka Pandora's Box, was an experimental task force which incorporated the use of highly combat-effective SCPs, including SCP-076, better known as Abel. The test showed initial success, but after they ran out of missions, Abel's bloodlust proved to be too great for the team to control, and the experiment as well as the task force were scrapped. However, this led to the creation of MTF Alpha-9, aka Last Hope, 
This is a mobile task force designed to train viable SCPs to provide services to the Foundation out in the field. This group has learned the lessons of its predecessor and has employed the use of more measured and reasonable anomalies. Those include SCP-073 or Kane, the much more even-tempered brother of Abel. MTF Beta-7 aka the Maz Hatters are the elite cleanup crew for anomalous biohazards, chemical spills, and radiological disasters. So if an area suddenly looks like it's going to become Chernobyl's scarier sequel or an anomalous fast-spreading disease is wrecking havoc over a wide area, the Maz Hatters are the guys to call. They worked closely on the containment of SCP-1280, a kind of parasitic nematode worm that often injects false memories into their victims. MTF Gamma-5 aka Red Herrings are the Foundation's chief disinformation division. They prevent the leaks of classified info to the public, and on the rare occasions that this information does somehow get out, they're in charge of burying it and administering necessary amnestic treatment to those affected. It's a thankless job, but you won't remember they did it either way. They gave amnestic treatment to the traumatized victims of SCP-1618, a malevolent urinal which replaced the user's valuables with disgusting alternatives, from toilet paper to pig intestines. NTF Gamma-6, aka Deep Feeders, investigate and track deep sea or oceanic anomalies, a job that commands the ultimate respect from people with thalassophobia, that's the fear of the deep ocean. If something terrifying and mysterious is stirring down there in the abyss, you better believe Gamma-6 are going to be the first ones down. They keep a close eye on a number of anomalies such as SCP-1264, an underwater amalgamation of sunken ships eager to drag down more vessels and add them to its mass. MTF Gamma-13, aka Asimov's Lawbringers, are a specialized task force devoted to investigating, tracking, and apprehending anomalies originating from Anderson Robotics, a group of interest that produces anomalous robots and machines. This includes examples of SCP-2806, a number of advanced anomalous prosthetic body parts that wish to attach themselves to a lacking host whether they want it or not. MTF Delta-5 aka Front Runners, are a large group of autonomous deep cover agents buried in various groups of interest across the globe. It's their job to gather intelligence from within to aid in the apprehension of anomalies before these groups can get their hands on them. They also sometimes make use of anomalies to track down others, such as when they requested to use SCP-185 a Russian R-105M radio used during the Cold War that can receive signals from any time period, including encrypted ones, but can also emit sound waves so powerful they can literally kill you. MTF Epsilon 9 aka Fire Eaters are the Foundation's resident pyromaniacs. They're the ones sent into missions involving extremely high temperature environments, and they're also highly skilled in the use of powerful incendiary weapons. If the Foundation needs to burn or avoid getting burned, the Fire Eaters are the ones for the job. Their vital skills assisted in containing SCP-165, massive colonies of carnivorous parasitic mites that eat prey to the bone. MTF Epsilon-11 Nine-Tailed Fox are another one of the most classified mobile task forces existing only under the oversight of the Red Right Hand. They work internally and are only dispatched to Foundation sites when standard protocols fail and multiple breaches are imminent. They were brought in to deal with the SCP-2139 incident, a strange psychological phenomenon that inexplicably increased the suggestibility of Foundation staff at Site-35. This made the infected staff agree with everything they heard. MTF Zeta-9 Mole Rats are a task force that specializes in the exploration and containment of anomalous areas that are either enclosed or underground, particularly if, due to the effects of the anomaly, the space-time fabric of the area is unstable. You may remember them from our series on SCP-1730, the mission into and out of the anomalous Site-13. MTF Ada-10 aka See No Evil are a team that specializes in taking on dangerous memes and cognito hazards that affect the victims through visual contact. One example is SCP-1561, a crown that when worn causes all those who see the person wearing the crown to imagine the wearer as their king and immediately adopt positions of servitude. While MTF Eta-10 aka Savage Beasts serve the opposite purpose, they deal with musical or auditory anomalies and any cognito hazards that work through the medium of sound, like SCP-2402 a chord progression which can regenerate old or dying cells. MTF Theta-4 aka Gardeners are a crack team of agents who face off against any botanical or plant-like anomalies. Their skills were put to use against SCP-1147, a collection of plum tree seeds which can grow out of literally any substance, even ones that are totally inorganic. MTF Theta-90 aka Angle Grinders are a team that specialize in two of the most frightening things out there, anomalies and math. 
These brainiacs deal with anomalous mathematical issues, like warped topologies and geometries. Even listing an example of the kind of anomalies they deal with here will make your head hurt, so just be thankful they're out there. NTF IOTA 10, or Damn Feds, are a huge network of undercover agents based in federal and local law enforcement agencies across the globe. They intercept any anomalous objects, beings, or information and make sure that it makes its way out of police evidence lockers and into Foundation hands without incident. MTF Kappa 10, or Skynet, is a temporary team of combined meat space and virtual agents tracking down and disrupting anomalous cyber threats, such as SCP-2987, an external hard drive basically capable of turning artificial intelligences into living souls for trades with soul-consuming anomalies. MTF Lambda 5, aka White Rabbits, are a group that specializes in combating reality warpers of all types, whether they're messing with space-time or exhibiting godlike powers. Some anomalies even respond directly to them, like SCP-2440. 46, a phenomenon where corpses, often identical to living White Rabbit's team members, suddenly manifest around San Jose, California. NTF Lambda 12, Pest Control, are a group of agents who exclusively go after anomalous vermin. Incidentally, they are one of the only MTFs who have never lost members in the line of duty. Their purview includes SCP-2810, an anomalous pathogen that causes the victim cells to become tiny versions of their own species, like a human cells becoming cell-sized humans. MTF Lambda 14, one-star reviewers, are a task force that deal with retail-oriented anomalies. Their main focus has become combating a sinister group of interest known as the Ambrose Restaurant, a chain of extra-dimensional restaurants with strange and anomalous food and service. MTF Mu-3, aka Highest Bidders, is a mobile task force devoted to preventing the group of interest, Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited, from disseminating dangerous anomalous objects and then obtaining and containing these objects. One such object is SCP-2818, a number of 50 cal sniper rifles that, when fired, turns the shooter into a bullet and fires them. MTF Mu-4, aka Debuggers, are particularly useful in the modern age as they track and contain anomalous electronics and technology, including isolating and containing anomalous websites and software. One of the anomalies dealt with by the debuggers is SCP-896, an online role-playing game that improves the physical and mental attributes of the player when they name their character after themselves. Remember when we said you didn't need to call the Ghostbusters? Well, that wasn't entirely true. Sometimes you need to get MTF Mu-13, aka Ghostbusters, on the line, since they're an MTF whose specialty is tracking intangible or incorporeal anomalies, particularly those considered sapient or sentient and they're on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural containment needs, like when you're plagued by SCP-1036, which are a number of haunted Congolese fetish dolls. MTF Nu-7, aka Hammer Down, are the ones you need to call when you need real heavy-duty work. They're a huge force with a massive stock of army vehicles and heavy weaponry, and are only called in for truly catastrophic events. They're also assisted in the containment of SCP-939, the voice-imitating, amnestic-producing red monsters. MTF Epsilon-6, aka Village Idiots, are a group of agents whose specialty is investigating and containing anomalous phenomena that occur in rural or suburban areas. If you live in a small town and you're on the run from a vicious monster, you better hope the village idiots are on their way. They've contained SCP-2561, a cat with a vintage television set for a head, capable of causing painful tinnitus. MTF Pi-1, aka City Slickers, are pretty much the exact opposite of the village idiots. They pursue anomalies in densely populated urban areas, particularly in the New York metropolitan area. They assisted in the ongoing containment of SCP-1155, the incredibly bloodthirsty predatory street art. MTF Sigma-66, aka 16 Tons, are basically the Foundation's own version of the Suicide Squad. They're a team made from captured members of other groups of interest who aren't particularly loyal to the Foundation, but whose very particular set of skills make up for that fact. MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara, are another group you might remember from the events of SCP-1730. These are a group unlike any other, immortal cyborgs made from the flesh of a dead god who can be upgraded as needed. They're equipped with experimental and state-of-the-art Foundation technology to take on thaumaturgic, magical, and psionic threats. MTF Psi-7, aka Home Improvement, is a team specializing in structural anomalies. In plain speak, they deal with anomalous activities concerning buildings, containing, and sometimes even demolishing when necessary, with a variety of heavy artillery, 
For example, they counteract the nightmarish SCP-3050, a building in North Carolina that once a year fuses all living matter inside its own structure on an atomic level. MTF Psi-8, aka the Silencers, are a team devoted to containing reanimation anomalies and those who've been affected by them. If you've just come back from the dead, then the Silencers are going to want to know your location. MTF Omega Zero, aka Ara Orun, are another highly classified mobile task force that's actually the memories of deceased Foundation personnel preserved on the Foundation intranet system. Their job is to protect their surviving co workers against informational threats mm -hmm. on the servers. They also contain SCP 3664, a damaged but highly advanced assault rifle existing in the non physical conceptual space. It can only be interacted with by thinking about interacting with it. And last but not least, MTF Omega. 12, aka Achilles Heel, is an anomalous task force, and these powerful reality warpers from another dimension hunt down dangerous and powerful reality warpers in ours. You can thank these guys for every single day that our reality continues on as normal, or whatever normal means now. They're enemies of SCP-3155, members of the iconic Pinkerton Detective Agency with anomalous abilities relating to combat. Alright, we did it! Of course, even this is only a sample of the vast number of mobile task forces at the Foundation's disposal who put their lives at risk every day to keep humanity, normality, and reality intact. They seem to have a task force perfectly tailored to every threat we could possibly encounter, and as new threats are cataloged, more mobile task forces are sure to arise to meet them. Want more in-depth explorations of any of these groups and their epic missions? Let us know in the comments below. The SCP Foundation is the most powerful organization on planet Earth. Thanks to their cooperation with all world governments as well as private organizations, front businesses, and wealthy benefactors, they have truly unlimited funds. Their ranks include the best and brightest humanity has to offer, and even some minds outside the human race. They have access to advanced and anomalous technology, from powerful weapons to memory-wiping amnestics, to state-of-the-art equipment that even Elon Musk could only dream of. And this is a good thing too, since we rely on them to contain thousands of anomalies and stay vigilant for thousands or even millions more. Everything from immortal lizards to supernatural sarkic flesh viruses to bona fide reality warping demigods like the Deer, the Gate Guardian, and the legendary Scarlet King. And who sits at the tip of this mighty pyramid, delegating to everyone below and keeping the wheels turning on this impossibly large behemoth of a group? Of course, it's the O5 Council. A group of 13 humans with so much money and institutional power, they're the closest a non-anomalous figure can come to being a god. Also commonly known as O5 Command, the Overseers, and the Overwatch, people below level 2 clearance at the Foundation have no idea who they are, or if they even actually exist. Those at level 3 and 4 know just enough to be terrified of them, and little else. Between them, they know every single secret kept by a foundation known for utmost confidentiality. They are the hungry spider at the center of this web of monsters, magic, backstabbing, and espionage, noticing even the tiniest of vibrations on their silk strings. Nothing about the O5 Council is simple or straightforward. Of the information out there and available about them, there's really no way to know just how much of it is intentional misinformation put out there to protect their secrets. It's said that they use complex layers of pseudonyms and body doubles. Some say that each number in the council actually represents several different people using the title. Some say there are far fewer members than 13, and these are just a series of smoke screens to avoid detection. Some even say to avoid total capture or assassination, at least one member remains in a space station orbiting the Earth at all times. Today we're going to tell you what we know. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it isn't. But as with all things regarding the O5 Council, it's certain to be fascinating either way. We're going to look at the Council's role in the Foundation, the kind of staff and the mobile task force that works around them, and some of the scattered and often contradictory theories about the identities of each of the 13 members of this exclusive Foundation cabal. We hope you have your level 5 clearance too, or we both might not make it to the end of the video. This is the SCP Foundation's O5 Council. Like a lot of secret organizations, the Foundation goes to great lengths to make sure their forbidden knowledge remains secret. 
That's why low-level junior researchers, guards, and janitorial staff aren't privy to where all the bodies are buried, both literally and metaphorically speaking. The Foundation has five levels of security clearance, and the O5 Council and their select staff are the only ones who are at Security Level 5, also known as Thaumiel Clearance. O5 Council members are also considered Class A Foundation staff, meaning they are of critical value to the operations of the Foundation. As such, they're not permitted to interact with any anomalies for fear of corruption, alteration, or death. Though, of course, seeing as they're the most powerful people on Earth, they don't always follow their own rules on this one. In the event of an emergency, their evacuation and transportation to a designated safe zone becomes a top priority to all Foundation underlings. They rarely, if ever, interact with the majority of the Foundation, instead favoring to use a vast network of messengers and go-betweens for security purposes. Much like the US Supreme Court, being a member of the O5 Council is supposed to be a lifetime appointment, and the death and or replacement of a member of the O5 Council is considered a truly extraordinary event. On occasion, there have been rumors of the O5 members performing power moves and killing their own colleagues to consolidate control. This type of event is thought to have been the ultimate fate of Dr. Jack Bright's father, who supposedly ascended to the position of O5 in hopes of freeing his anomalous daughter from containment. <gasps> Rumor has it that he was assassinated by his fellow council members and replaced for his trouble. While the O5 Council aren't meant to interact with any anomalies, this isn't always the case in practice. It's possible that members of the O5 Council make regular use of their access to SCP-006, a small well whose water has the ability to cure disease and imbue vitality, health, and longevity in anyone who drinks it. It's believed by some that as a precaution against such potential attacks from powerful reality warpers and CK-class reality restructuring events, each member of O5 carries a small charm made from the flesh of a deceased but immensely strong reality warper. This supposedly creates a pocket of dimensional stability around them wherever they go. While it's believed that all members of O5 Council are fundamentally human, it's possible or even likely that many of them have experienced anomalous alterations during their ascent to ultimate power. They're also said to surround themselves with a number of powerful anomalous individuals for protection. Which leads us nicely to our next point. Who works directly with the notoriously private and inaccessible O5 Council? Let's take a look. First, the O5 Council's muscle. Mobile Task Force Alpha-01, appropriately nicknamed the Red Right Hand. These are the best of the best, handpicked for both skill and absolute loyalty to the Council. They work with an extra layer of secrecy and accept their orders directly from O5. If the O5 Council decides it doesn't care for you, then the red laser dot that appears on your head an hour later is attached to the rifle of a red right hand operative. This is a group with a checkered past though. Many of their members are believed to have splintered from the group to form the Chaos Insurgency, a group in direct opposition to the Foundation. Though if you ever bring this up within earshot of a member of the O5 Council, your likelihood of going mysteriously missing shortly after is extremely high. But it takes more than just guns to keep the Foundation's mission moving forward. The figure who represents the interests of the O5 Council on the world stage is known simply as the Administrator. This mysterious, eccentric, and likely anomalous figure is the powerful mouthpiece of the Council, and it's a role that's been held by a number of people since the Foundation was first founded. The other staff assigned to the O5 Council are sometimes referred to as the Factorum, and these are some of the only people outside of the O5 Council occasionally afforded level 5 clearances. These bodyguards and personal assistants are often immensely powerful, both in the sense that they wield a great deal of institutional strength and that they're often powerful anomalies themselves. Don't expect just anyone to get elected to these positions after all. Only the very best get to work in close proximity to the O5 Council. So this leaves us with the big question. Who exactly are the O5 Council? The short answer is that we don't know for sure, and that the information we do have about the 13 most powerful people in the world is often contradictory and strange. First, we have O5-1, often considered the most powerful of the entire Council. Many believe that O5-1 is one of the occult holdovers from the member organizations that first started the Foundation. 
And if that's true, O5-1 is likely to be at least 200 years old. They've been able to survive to this age thanks to magical or anomalous intervention. The race and gender of O5-1 varies between accounts. O5-2 is considered to be one of the more actively anomalous of the O5 council members. While accounts split on whether they are male or female, Consistent elements and stories about them paint the picture of an elderly person with clues to a mysterious past, like having crucifixion scars or consistent ties to Dr. Sophia Light, a holdover from an erased timeline. O5-3 is consistently seen as male and largely seen as being of European descent, regardless of the other details shared. He's generally considered to be extremely intelligent, as well as one of the nicer members of the council acting as a kind of conscience for the others. O5-4 is another figure considered to be most likely male, and the circumstances of their entrance into the council are generally considered to be rather spectacular. Whether you believe the story that they got in by killing the previous O5-4 during a hostile takeover situation, or that they were the first to collect the entire Little Mister series from Dr. Wondertainment. O5-5 is also most likely male, and some accounts consider him to be one of the more front-facing members of the council. He's more likely to interact with the public than others, and it's speculated that he's the one who runs the vast network of front businesses regularly used for cover by the Foundation at large. O5-6 is most likely male, and probably of European descent. His reputation is mixed, though. Some speculate that he was formerly the Foundation's top field agent, while others believe he's a puppet of the Global Occult Coalition, one of the Foundation's rival organizations. To some, he's known as the Cowboy. Some believe that O5-7 is a woman of South Asian descent. She's said to be a charismatic master tactician and plays a crucial role in selecting and hiring the elite staff that work around the O5 Council. O5-8 is one of the more mysterious figures, even among the already extremely secretive O5 Council. Some speculate that they may have been assassinated, as they haven't been seen in public for quite some time, though this may just be a ruse to fool would-be backstabbers. O5-9 is another somewhat controversial figure within the Council. Some believe that O5-9 is a woman hired to join the Council directly from the public sector after a scandal. Others believe that O5-9 is merely the informal title for whomever is the acting head of the Foundation Intelligence Agency. O5-10 is widely believed to have vast combat experience of one form or another. Some refer to them as the Assassin, a female former Foundation hitman who's likely the most proficient killer alive. Others call them the Veteran or the Mad General, a former high-level member of the U.S. military. It's speculated by some that O5-11 is a high-level politician placed by the Council on the United States Senate to maintain Foundation control over political questions and dealings. Others believe he's an 80-year-old Japanese bureaucrat with self-esteem issues. Yet another rumor states that this person is actually the Foundation's chief disinformation officer, so maybe both of these rumors are just lies meant to lead us off the track. O5-12 is believed by many to have once been Adam Bright, father of famous Foundation researcher and anomaly Dr. Jack Bright. He worked his way onto the Council to try to free his own daughter, SCP-321, from containment, and was assassinated by his fellow Council members in the process. Or, O5-12 might be the accountant for the Overseer Council, Maybe one day we'll know whether O5-12 is best known for being someone who climbed the ranks of the most powerful organization in the world to save his daughter, or if he really just likes spreadsheets. Whether O5-13 ever actually existed is hotly debated. Many speculate that there were originally only 12 members, and that 13 was added as a tiebreaker in council votes. Others say 13 was only added due to the modern occult significance of the number 13. Some believe there is no 13, and it's merely another attempt to keep everyone on their toes. Or there's a rumor that all of the members of the Council are O5-13, taking turns to act as the tie-breaking 13th vote. Whatever the case is with any of the particular members of the group, the O5 Council is one of the smallest and yet most important groups of people in the SCP Foundation universe. They're the ones behind everything, hearing every whisper and pulling every string. And if you know anything about them, 
even the facts you just saw in this video. It's probably only because they want you to. It's the end of the world as we know it, and you're feeling less than fine. That's because some of the SCP Foundation's greatest fears have been realized, and we're in the middle of an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But what exactly is an XK-class specifically? How does it fit in among the other K-class scenarios that the Foundation stays ever vigilant for? What are some of the ways the world can end as a result of anomalous activity? And if one of these events does unfold, what can be done to stop it? Well, grab your water filters and head down to the nearest Foundation-approved apocalypse bunker. Not that it'll save you. Because we're talking XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios. Sadly for us, there's actually a huge number of ways that the life and reality we consider normal can suddenly disappear. These are known to the Foundation as K-class scenarios, a description given to any event that will severely alter reality or normality on a global scale. There are too many of these to list right now, but the most prominent threats are SK, NK, CK, ZK, and, of course, XK scenarios. An SK scenario is when another species or civilization surpasses or replaces humanity, such as the threat that the Foundation believes SCP-1000 poses, while an NK or Grey Goose scenario posits that the world may be overrun by out-of-control self-replicating nanomachines, covering everything in Grey Goo. CK-class restructuring scenarios refer to a situation in which some kind of reality-warping anomaly irreparably alters or restructures reality as we know it. By contrast, a ZK-class end-of-reality scenario involves an anomaly in physics causing reality in general to just cease. But the most feared of all and the most abundant in its potential causes is the XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. This is quite literally the apocalypse. Armageddon, Judgment Day, End Times, Lights Out. There are well in excess of 60 anomalies capable of triggering an XK-class scenario, and sadly far fewer that can reverse them. T.S. Eliot wrote, This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. As anyone at the SCP Foundation could tell you, there are plenty more ways the world can end than that. Here are some of the most strange, terrifying, or downright interesting examples of anomalous apocalypses, starting with the more ridiculous end of the apocalyptic scale. SCP-871 is a series of over 200 cakes, varying in size and variety of cake. If any of these cakes are eaten, they'll be replaced by a magically appearing cake within 24 hours. However, if the cakes are not eaten, they'll still produce a replacement. If the cakes are damaged but not eaten, a replacement will appear instantaneously. In other words, if the replication is not properly inhibited by the SCP Foundation, there's a considerable risk of the world being overrun with impossible quantities of cake. It may sound silly, but Foundation scientists have estimated that an uncontrolled outbreak of SCP-871 would render the world completely uninhabitable in a mere 80 days. The Foundation tracks a number of frightening SCPs capable of quickly getting out of control, such as the 100% infectious and deadly prion SCP-008 and SCP-610, aka the flesh that hates. But none seem to present the same genuine threat to human life as an epidemic of global cake duplication. Another bizarre anomaly capable of causing an abrupt apocalypse is SCP-5092. This anomaly is a strange phenomenon that exclusively affects every sitting U.S. president. At 7.53 p.m. every single night, the president's nose will begin to itch. When this happens, naturally, the president will itch his nose. This may seem like an extremely innocent pattern of behavior, but the true danger occurs when the president affected by 5092 doesn't act on this sudden and irritating itch. If the president doesn't itch, it will cause SCP-5092-1 to spontaneously manifest. 5092-1 is a massive asteroid, over 20 kilometers in diameter that manifests above the North Pole and begins hurtling towards Earth at incredible speeds. If the President fails to scratch his nose by 8.53 p.m. every single night, this asteroid will collide with Earth and invariably cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. The Foundation is required to keep a constant watch on the current sitting U.S. President for this exact reason. SCP-2950 is in a similar situation. It's not necessarily always a potential XK-class waiting to happen, 
but under the right circumstances, it absolutely can be. According to the Surface Level Files, 2950 is an anomalous folding metal chair. When sat on for over an hour, it becomes impossible to convince the sitter to leave the chair without using force. However, as a file only accessible by a single member of the O5 Council reveals, 2950 is actually an anomaly that takes the form of whatever the majority of people aware of it think it is. The misinformation about it actually being a chair has been spread this whole time just to reduce its potential threat. An ancient tome from the Sacred Library of the Serpent's Hand, though, depicts 2950 as an all-powerful and incredibly deadly XK-class scenario threat. If this book ever fell into the wrong hands and its information was shared, it would become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and likely result in the exact kind of XK-class apocalypse we fear. SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, is a limestone cavern in Indiana leading to an alternate world that already experienced an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. A complete and total extinction event so powerful it even led to the deaths of thought-to-be immortal figures like SCP-682 and Dr. Bright. While the cavern is thankfully now sealed off, it's believed that the force of pure death lurking on the other side is more than capable of causing the same mass extinction event in our reality if it ever gained passage here. Another anomaly very likely to cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario is a creature known as the Devourer of Worlds, which lives in a desert-like pocket dimension beyond SCP-2317. While the beast is currently bound, Foundation scientists anticipate it breaking from its bonds and moving into our dimension, at which point it is likely to live up to its name and eat all of us. Perhaps the most feared entity in all of SCP Foundation lore, the Scarlet King is an ultra-powerful, godlike being created by the tension between organized modernity and the primal violence of the past. The Scarlet King makes repeated attempts to enter our reality, and his various devoted cults do what they can to help him make the jump. It's believed that if he ever did find his way into our dimension, the end of the world is an extremely likely outcome, given his seething hatred for all modern societies. Some anomalies don't seem to cause XK-class end-of-the-world events, but they are predicted to potentially cause them to happen sometime in the future. One such example is SCP-3769, a seemingly normal scientific calculator that binds itself to the body of whatever touches it. It then, depending on the number input into the calculator, regresses the biology of the user into some prior stage of evolution. But when the calculator was tested on SCP-411, a 400-year-old man who ages in reverse, it broke, and began performing the exact opposite function to what was intended. It started evolving the subjects it touched into future stages of evolution. While this works successfully on all animals tested, from octopi to macaws, it killed every human it was tested on even when the evolution feature was cranked down to its smallest setting of a single generation. Humans, it seems, are at the end of the road in terms of our evolutionary journey. Foundation scientists have posited that this could foretell an XK-class human extinction event within our lifetimes, though we don't know what form it will take. Another SCP that seems to function as a grim omen is SCP-152. This is a large hardcover book that features startlingly detailed descriptions of events in the past, present, and future. The one common denominator is that the small differences, often about the actions of the Foundation, lead to calamitous XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios in the book. The Foundation has found this incredibly pessimistic work of literature valuable as an instruction guide in avoiding the coming disasters that it predicts, but it's possible that it may somehow predict an incoming XK that we can't wriggle out of. Another grim harbinger of a potential dark future is SCP-1678, also known as Unlondon. This sprawling dystopian city beneath modern-day London suggests an XK-class extinction scenario above ground, caused by rampaging anomalies getting loose from Foundation containment. The museum in the doomed underground city displays a number of dangerous Kettier-class anomalies wreaking havoc on the surface world. For all we know, these horrifying events may someday come to pass for us. At this point, it's understandable if you're feeling a little paranoid. With all these possible XK-class scenarios looming over us, from being smothered by cake to doom foretold by a calculator, it's easy to let a sense of hopeless roll over you. And these aren't even all of the anomalies capable of doing this. But never fear, 
There are three anomalies out there that have the capability to reverse even some of the most dire XK situations. The one hope is that they can be reached in time. One of the more practical methods is activating SCP-2000. This anomaly is a huge facility hidden beneath Yellowstone National Park. Through a number of anomalous technologies, 2000 is capable of making exact copies of everyone who existed on Earth in the last 20 years. The facility also stores all human knowledge, allowing things to pick up right after they left off. This new race of humans is then able to rebuild society from the ground up, at which point the Foundation will re-emerge and erase everyone's memories of the XK-class end-of-the-world scenario that started it all. SCP-2000 isn't effective in all situations, though. What if, for example, the XK scenario destroyed the conditions for supporting human life on Earth? Or what if SCP-2000 itself is destroyed during the process of the XK-class scenario? Thankfully, when it seems like all of their hopes have failed, there are two remaining anomalies that can function as a sort of total reset button if brought together, no matter the severity of the apocalypse. These are SCP-055, the unknowable anti-meme, and SCP-579, another mysterious anomaly known only by its extensive containment procedures. The combination of the anomalous effects of 055 and 579 as laid out in Rajet's proposal and the article for SCP-2998 is the Foundation's ultimate secret weapon for preventing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. If the two are united during said scenario, the universe resets to a time before the XK-class started and prevents it from happening. That's why if the world is ending around you, there's no better hope of canceling the apocalypse than bringing 055 and 579 together. So there you have it. Everything you need to know to have a basic knowledge about the end of all life on Earth. Preventing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario is like playing an extremely high-stakes game of whack-a-mole. You never really know when the next existential threat is going to pop up. And perhaps the one that finally ends it all is closer than you think. Congratulations! You just started your new job at the SCP Foundation as a junior researcher. We help you survive long enough to retire and collect your Foundation pension. But you've got a lot to learn before you can even think about that. You're here to find out more about some of the most mysterious entities known to man, and the Foundation depends on you to do your job right, or the world might not see tomorrow. But hey, no pressure. You're gonna hear a lot of new terminology on the job, big scary words like Apollyon and Thaumatology, and of course, Euclid and Keter, the two most common containment classifications. Today we're going to answer a question that's been on a lot of people's minds. What do these classifications actually mean, and what's the difference between them? First, it must be noted that these classes don't have much to do with danger as you may think. Instead, object classes are all about how difficult an anomaly is to contain. And we're going to take you on a crash course of each of them, and provide some examples so you can broaden your idea of what exactly Euclid, Keter, and all the other classes of anomalies can be. Of course, while Euclid and Keter are perhaps the best known object classes, they aren't the only ones. Just below them, in terms of severity, is the safe class. It may be every guard in D-class's dream to get assigned to safe SCPs, but this classification doesn't mean the anomaly in question is harmless. It does mean that they are easy to contain, though, often requiring very few resources or certain specific activation mechanisms. For example, SCP-507, the Unwilling Dimension Hopper. The Unwilling Dimension Hopper is fully cooperative with Foundation containment protocols, earning him the safe class. SCP-662, the butler's handbell, while capable of extreme violence, doesn't activate unless someone rings it, making it safe to store. And of course, SCP-999 The Tickle Monster earned its safe rating by essentially wanting to keep Foundation staff pleased at every turn and requiring virtually nothing in the way of containment. Euclid comes next. This class actually has the widest scope of any object class under Foundation control, and the grand majority of objects fall under this banner. Unlike safe class anomalies, Euclid anomalies require greater resources to keep contained. The Euclid classification can also mean that containment isn't always reliable, and is often given due to either a lack of knowledge about the anomaly, or there being some degree of inherent unpredictability. Unpredictable is really the key word when it comes to Euclid SCPs. 
Anomalies that are either autonomous, meaning they can move on their own, sentient, meaning that they're capable of thought, or sapient, meaning they are partially intelligent, almost always automatically fall into the Euclid class. This is because anything that moves or thinks on its own is capable of surprising and unpredictable behavior, notwithstanding certain exceptions like the aforementioned Tickle Monster. This brings us to Keter. In the simplest terms, you could describe Keter class anomalies as Euclid, but worse. Again, this has nothing to do with how violent or dangerous the anomaly is, merely how difficult it is to contain. Keter class anomalies often require extensive resources to fully contain. Containment methods are also often extra thorough and complex, though when it comes to a Keter class anomaly, there's no guarantee the methods will be 100% effective. There are a number of reasons an SCP can slip into Keter territory, including but not limited to extreme aggression and its frequent escape attempts, existing in large numbers over a wide area, and having anomalous abilities that make them particularly difficult to contain, like teleportation or the ability to walk through walls. To better explain this, Foundation researchers have devised a simple method known as the locked box test. If you were to leave an item inside a locked box and stop supervising it, and it's still there when you get back, then the item is probably safe. If you leave an item inside a locked box without supervision and you're not sure what exactly will happen, then it's probably Euclid. If you leave an item inside a locked box without supervision and it easily breaks free, then you likely have a Keter object on your hands. Or rather, did, before it broke out and ran off. Before we go any further, it's worth briefly mentioning that there are two other primary object classes that cover most SCPs that aren't under the safe, Euclid, and Keter banners. These are Thaumiel and Neutralize. Thaumiel anomalies are SCPs that are used to contain other SCPs, such as SCP-3000, the legendary amnestic-producing Anatashisha. Neutralized anomalies are objects that either have lost their anomalous qualities or been straight-up destroyed. A good example being SCP-1762, the cardboard box which used to contain the Land of Fantasy. But back to Euclid and Keter. What are some good examples of Euclid and Keter class anomalies in containment right now? Let's take a look at some of the Foundation's most iconic Euclid classes first. Kicking things off, we have SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy. We all know and fear this self-conscious serial-killing monster that murders anything that sees its face. As you already know, when someone sees the face of the Shy Guy, nothing can stand in its way on its quest to utterly destroy them. The monster has not only proven successful in causing mass casualty events, it's also pretty much indestructible, and has shown that it's able to tear its way out of containment with ease. So you may be wondering, why is the Shy Guy Euclid and not Keter? While it may surprise you to hear this, SCP-096 is actually closer to safe than Keter. The monster may be incredibly dangerous when its rage state is activated, but it's proven fairly easy for the Foundation to control this activation. The only times that 096 has breached containment is when photographs of its face have been found out in the real world. But as long as the Foundation can prevent people from seeing its face, it poses no real risk of containment breach. The very fact that the Foundation can't know for sure how many photos of it are out there adds an element of unpredictability to its containment, and that is why, despite being incredibly scary and dangerous, 096 is firmly Euclid. Next, another Euclid anomaly that needs no introduction, SCP-173, also known as the Sculpture. This nasty piece of modern art has given workers at the Foundation many a sleepless night thanks to its terrifying tendency to snap the necks of anyone who isn't looking at it. This is a creature so scary that even SCP-682 feels uncomfortable around it. Much like SCP-096, 173 has also proved nigh impossible to kill, and in a containment breach, it's been known to stack up bodies like it was Judgment Day. So why just Euclid rather than Keter? Once again, it all comes down to how the Foundation understands just how 173 ticks. As everyone knows by now, 173 is paralyzed whenever someone is looking at it. As a result, the Foundation has been able to devise containment methods that center around keeping 173 constantly observed. The reason it's Euclid rather than safe is that while quite reliable, this method is also somewhat time and resource intensive. As with anything that requires a high degree of human involvement, 
the potential for human error is always there. And finally, in our rundown of famous Euclid-class objects, we have SCP-3008, more broadly known as the Infinite Ikea. This sinister retail giant is a pocket dimension hiding within an Ikea superstore, leading to what seems to be an infinite furniture warehouse filled with scary, faceless creatures known as the Staff. Hundreds or perhaps even thousands of people have become trapped in SCP-3008, and it may even connect to other dimensions. This is one place where you really, really don't want to get stuck while shopping for a new piece of furniture. But it's still Euclid. Why? Well, because, to the best of our knowledge, there's only one gateway into 3008's pocket dimension inside our reality, and the Foundation has that specific site on lockdown. While there are still things we don't know about SCP-3008, the Foundation has been able to secure and contain the entrance. It's Euclid rather than safe because this entrance still needs to be patrolled regularly to ward off any staff attempting to escape and prevent further victims from entering, which is a low-risk but resource-heavy job. Next up is Keter Class. First, we have the terrifying SCP-682, also known as the hard-to-destroy reptile. Anyone who's seen our videos on this nasty creature knows that it really, really lives up to that name. 682 may not be the most dangerous SCP, especially with cosmic monsters like the Scarlet King and the Devourer of Worlds out there, but it's one of the most hardy thanks to its incredible adaptive abilities. Because of the way 682 adapts to pretty much any threat, it's virtually impossible to attack it the same way twice. However, if being violent and indestructible was all it took to become a Keter-class anomaly, the Shy Guy would be right there with it. There are two key factors that push 682 into Keter territory. It's incredibly high intelligence and the fact that it reacts unpredictably to all external stimuli. Because of its intelligence, 682 is able to actively scheme to escape containment, something it does with such regularity that the Foundation is constantly trying to terminate it. And because of its adaptive abilities, its behavior in response to containment is often nigh impossible to predict. As a result of all of this, 682 is a complete nightmare to keep locked up, making it Keter. Next, a Keter-class anomaly that's not quite as well known, and not nearly as ferocious. SCP-3663, also known as the Tunnel Monster or the Cardboard Box Monster. This entity is as scary as it is incredibly sad. He was once a normal little boy, playing in an abandoned industrial area with his friends. He had built himself a crude monster costume out of cardboard boxes, but through anomalous means, this costume bonded with the little boy, turning his organs into cardboard and twine. Now it manifests in pipes and tunnels across the country, approaching nearby humans and causing paranoia and fear. It'll then grab his victims and transport them elsewhere leaving them unconscious and afraid, but otherwise unharmed. Clearly, we're not looking at an anomaly even close to being as dangerous and deadly to SCP-682, but it's still very much Keter. Why? Because the teleporting ability inherent to SCP-3663 makes it incredibly difficult to consistently contain, along with its inherent distrust of Foundation personnel. The Foundation have yet to devise a truly effective containment method for 3663 and its teleporting antics, so Keter class is where it remains despite it being mostly benign. And finally, SCP-1000, aka Bigfoot. This is one of the few anomalies that genuinely holds the moral high ground over the Foundation, on account of them formerly being an incredibly advanced species almost wiped out by humanity in the past. Now, the Foundation is feeding everyone the lie that even looking at one of these creatures can result in death, even though it can't. The reality is that the Foundation hopes to keep SCP-1000 suppressed, fearing that if they ever regained their former glory, they would surely oppress humanity just as humanity had oppressed them. Even though, once again, it doesn't appear that SCP-1000 has any such malicious intentions. So why are these abnormally large and abnormally intelligent apes Keter class? Once again, it all comes down to two facts tipping the classification scales, and in this case, those are population and dispersion. There are a lot of these creatures out there, especially across North America, and the fact they appear in forests all across the country makes it incredibly difficult for the Foundation to keep a lid on them. 
Seeing as a civilian simply seeing an SCP-1000 specimen constitutes a containment breach, these happen frequently, especially if you run encrypted and conspiracy circles and are out actually looking to meet one. That brings us to the end of our crash course on Euclid and Keter class anomalies. We hope you enjoyed your stay and managed to survive all the strange and horrific entities we've covered. Let us know if you've enjoyed this video in the comments and want to see more of the ins and outs of the SCP Foundation's classification system explained. But for now, you're finally ready to start your research role at the SCP Foundation. Just make sure you've got your last will and testament written before your first day. Are you bored with where you work? There's no shame in it. A lot of people are. Or maybe you hit a run of bad luck recently and you got furloughed or let go from your old job. It's a stressful time and you're probably asking, what type of career would be right for me? Maybe you want some excitement, like chasing down escaped monsters from high security containment facilities. Maybe you want something a little more intellectually engaging, like joining some of the world's finest minds in finding the answers to mysterious ancient secrets. Or maybe you're the ambitious type, someone with plenty of hashtag hustle. Perhaps nothing would satisfy you more than climbing to the very top of the corporate ladder into a position that would make you one of the most powerful human beings on the planet. If any or even all of these sound like they describe you, then maybe your perfect career would be working for the SCP Foundation, an incredibly powerful top-secret organization devoted to securing, containing, and protecting the supernatural across the globe and beyond. You could be one of the thousands of little turning cogs that keeps this organization running, and keeping the world safe from supernatural threats. But you can't even get into your local country club. How can you find your way into one of the most elite groups in history? Well, we can't pretend it'll be easy, but it's definitely not impossible. Today, we're going to give you a primer on the potential ways you could join the proud ranks of the SCP Foundation. With help from files and evidence across the Foundation database, we figured out many of the different positions available at the SCP Foundation and what actions and qualifications you may need to make the cut. Though we can't promise you won't be terminated, vaporized, eaten, or sent to a terrifying pocket dimension in the process. First, it's vital to know exactly what you're applying for. The SCP Foundation is a complex group, but thankfully for us, it does have a command structure that's pretty easy to understand. This will help us figure out the positions on offer, so you can update your LinkedIn profile accordingly. There are two main categories of jobs at play here. We have security clearance categories, which range from 0 to 5, and we have personnel classifications, which run from A class to E class. Let us break it down for you. Level 0 security clearance covers jobs like logistics and janitorial services. They're the lowest entry level of any foundation jobs, and you'll basically be told nothing. You might as well be cleaning the bathrooms at a local gym. Level 1 covers most of the same jobs as level 0, except that these staff members perform their jobs in closer proximity to anomalies. So you'll still be cleaning bathrooms, but at greater risk to your life. Level 2 is the most common level of clearance, and covers most of the jobs you can apply for at the Foundation. Junior researchers, field operatives, containment specialists. You have a decent grasp on the strangeness of your profession, but you're still locked out of the major secrets. Level 3 is a step up and covers most of the senior research staff, project managers, security officers, response team members, and mobile task force operatives, all of which we'll discuss more later. Level 4 is top secret and reserved for only senior administrative positions, like site directors, security directors, or mobile task force commanders. Finally, level 5, which gives access to every secret the Foundation holds and more. This is reserved largely for the O5 Council and those working directly under them. We're not saying it's necessarily impossible for you to get into one of those 13 seats of ultimate power, but it's probably impossible. The A through E personnel class are a little easier to process. The further along your letter is in the alphabet, the more dangerous your job, because you work in closer proximity to anomalies. A class staff are considered critical to the running of the Foundation, like the O5 Council, so they're usually not even allowed near an anomaly. D class, as you probably already know, are guinea pigs regularly thrown into the clutches of anomalies to see what happens. The only thing worse is E class which applies to agents who are already under the active effects of anomalies, and thus are quarantined. Now that you fully understand the command structure of the SCP Foundation, we can talk about specific roles, 
and what it may take to find these various job titles attached to your name. We'll start with the lowest of the low and work our way up to the top of the pyramid, starting, of course, with D-Class. The upside of D-Class is that you don't really need any kind of qualifications to join. The majority of D-Class personnel are death row inmates, so if you commit a few capital offenses and get yourself caught, you'll likely be up for consideration. After all, employee turnaround for D-Class is pretty crazy, for obvious reasons. The downside is that you really, really, really don't want to become a D-Class. While there are some rare examples of the lives of D-Classes being improved, like the one who was released to pursue a law degree after being educated by SCP-5094, it's largely a literally dead-end job. But let's say you're a little luckier than that, and the job you seek, while still dangerous, will at least get you a decent pension and dental coverage. We're talking about the day-to-day bread-and-butter jobs that keep the whole foundation running. Site staff. If you're working on site at any of the hundreds or even thousands of secure areas the foundation maintains across the globe, you have four different possible career paths. Containment Specialist, Researcher, Security Officer, and Tactical Response Officer. Containment specialists are, as you can probably tell from the name, experts in maintaining containment for anomalies. This career path forks into two possible branches. In the more active of the two branches, containment specialists enter zones of active anomalous activity and contain the anomaly for transport back to the nearest operational site. To join this career path, you'd likely be expected to come from a military background due to the risky and tactical nature of the job. The second branch is a little less hands-on. These are the actual engineers and technicians who work with researchers to devise the containment procedures for the various SCPs. For this role, you'll not only need to likely understand physics and engineering at an expert level, you'll also need an extraordinarily creative mind. You'll need to think outside of the box to keep the anomalies in the box. A recurring theme you'll find when it comes to Foundation jobs is that you don't seek out the Foundation for a job. If you're the right person and show potential, they'll find you. Researchers are a similar story. These are the best research scientists in the world, scouted by the Foundation to assist the cause. If you're someone with a true passion for science, with topics including but not limited to biology, physics, chemistry, botany, and xenobiology, and you're willing to put in the work to reach the very top of your field, the Foundation may just come knocking at your door. Much like a lot of prestigious universities, the Foundation also sometimes considers legacy candidates. The famous Dr. Bright, for example, became a member of the Foundation's research corps because his mother and father worked for the Foundation, and it didn't hurt that several of his siblings were anomalous too. Next, security officers, more informally known as guards. This job is worth applying for the paycheck alone, as there's likely some good hazard pay attached to it. Most security officers perform physical guard duties and are recruited from law enforcement, the corrections industry, and the military. However, the other half of the security officers work in information security and, as a result, are chosen for their IT prowess and their background in the intelligence community. And finally, as far as site staff are concerned, we have tactical response officers. Don't expect to get this job if your background is civilian, though, since these special operatives are the first line of defense between Foundation sites and external threats, from anomalous attackers to hostile groups of interest trying to infiltrate. If you want this job, you'll really need to put in the hours, days, months, and years rising through the ranks in the military. If you do get the job, though, you'll likely be stationed at one of the larger and more important sites to remain on constant guard for any potential threats. But let's say you don't want to work on a containment site. Maybe you want to travel, see the world, get a little excitement. Thankfully, there are two different career paths that allow you to do just that field agents, and the mobile task force members. The field agent position is one of the more accessible in the Foundation, largely because of the fact that there are so many ways in. If you're an exceptionally observant and discreet person, this job is probably for you seeing as it's essentially being a spy for the Foundation. You may be offered the job if you work in law enforcement, the government, or any kind of emergency service. These undercover agents also infiltrate groups of interest or secret societies the Foundation wishes to keep an eye on, like the Serpent's Hand or the Children of the Scarlet King. If you're in any of these positions or already work as a field agent for the mainstream intelligence community, 
Becoming a Foundation Field Agent may just be your calling. Mobile task forces are a little more extreme. They're made up of elite operatives drawn from all over the Foundation, often with a heavy emphasis on military experience. The more specialized you are, the more likely you are to land a spot on one of these teams. Are you an expert in explosives? Try for MTF Epsilon 9, the Fire Eaters. Are you an expert in epidemiology and biohazard containment? Join MTF Beta 7, dubbed the Maz Hatters. Are you a benevolent anomaly aligned with the interests of the Foundation? MTF Alpha 9, aka Last Hope, is just for you. The Foundation sometimes even recruits ex-members of enemy groups of interests into MTFs on occasion. Of course, despite there being plenty of ways into this profession, none of them are easy, and the job carries huge risks due to how often MTFs see combat. What if you've always wanted to be more of a leader than a follower, though? You're a natural manager, someone who has all their anomalous ducks in a row. Perhaps you're eyeing the role of site director, the one who all other department heads on site report directly to. How do you get your foot in the door? It's simple. Site directors start off working some other job for the foundation, like researcher or security officer, and simply climb through the ranks until they reach the most senior position in the site where they work. Oftentimes, site directors were previously very committed researchers, like Dr. Bright or Dr. Gears. And finally, the biggest question of all. How does one become a member of the legendary O5 Council? Due to the extremely mysterious nature of the Council, this one is hard to say. Exact information about each member and their past is shrouded in secrecy, but it stands to reason that any new members are elected in by a majority of the pre-existing Council members on the board. Like Dr. Bright's father, Adam Bright, it is theoretically possible to work your butt off and get into the O5 Council through decades of pure grit, but you're probably wasting your time. The Council works in mysterious ways, after all. If we've learned anything today, it's that any job actually worth having at the SCP Foundation isn't gotten easily. But hey, considering the SCP Foundation has its shadowy fingers in every pie, and its thousands of factions worldwide are masked by just as many public-facing front businesses, for all you know, you might be working for the Foundation already. You're a researcher working at Site-19 for the SCP Foundation just going about your day, minding your own business. You've spent your morning keeping an eye on the D-classes who are keeping their eyes on SCP-173. The clock strikes noon, and you decide to break for lunch, where you'll enjoy the delicious tuna sandwich you made for yourself this morning. You're sitting alone in one of Site-19's numerous employee break rooms, chewing the first bite of your sandwich as you try in vain to wrap your head around SCP-055. The unknowable anti-meme, when a scent wafts past your nose, it's the worst thing you've ever smelled. Like a mix of body odor, dirt, and musty old clothes. You turn to look for the source of the smell, and suddenly realize that you're not alone in the room. There's a man standing next to you. He's tall, with a scruffy face lined by age. He's wearing a long woolen coat that dangles past his knees. He doesn't say a word though. He's just staring, but not at you. At your sandwich. Before you can open your tuna-filled mouth to say something, his great coat opens, and a long green tentacle slithers out grabbing your sandwich and pulling it out of your hands. You start to protest, and then another limb emerges from the coat, long and reptilian. It places a single finger upon your lips and shushes you. The tentacle lifts your delicious tuna sandwich up to the strange man's face and he starts to eat it in front of you, maintaining eye contact the entire time. Then after he finishes your lunch, he just turns and makes his exit, leaving you alone in the break room and hungry. Later that day, you request a meeting with your supervisor, hoping to get some answers about what you saw in the break room. Maybe some compensation for the stolen sandwich or at the very least, a little sympathy for how hungry you've been all afternoon. But your supervisor does none of that. Instead, the color drains from their cheeks and they begin to sweat. You ask what's wrong, and your supervisor murmurs one brief sentence. You just met the most powerful person in the world. Of course you've heard of the O5 Council. They're the most powerful people in the entire SCP Foundation, both in terms of institutional control and perhaps even literal raw power. Depending on who you ask, they might be a group of elite Foundation agents and researchers who rose to the very top of the pyramid, 
a secret room full of dusty, old, power-hungry bureaucrats, or a cabal of superpowered beings that transcend the bounds of our dimension. In short, almost nobody is more powerful than the Foundation's O5 Council. But who oversees the Overseers, if anyone at all? If they do exist, then who's the one figure in Foundation lore more secret than the most secretive group imaginable? There's only one answer to this question. A figure known only as... The Administrator. If you spend some time researching the affairs of the SCP Foundation, there's no doubt you would have heard the name. Perhaps in a heavily redacted file, or whispered in fear by a site director worrying about incurring the mysterious figure's wrath. Today we intend to do the impossible, and we just might end up terminated by the red right hand because of it. But we're going to gather all the information available to us, and try to figure out who or what the clandestine administrator actually is. We'll answer your most obvious question first. What's with those weird sandwich-stealing arms? One of the few almost universally accepted facts about the administrator is their possession of SCP-262, also known as the Coat of Many Arms. Little to nothing is known about the coat's history before it came into the administrator's possession, and given the huge amount of power the administrator wields within the Foundation, nobody has the authority to press them for further information. The coat's interior is a spatial anomaly, from which a huge number of anomalous limbs can emerge and perform tasks on the wearer's behalf. It's such a useful item that the Foundation has even considered weaponizing it for field agents, as the arms emerging from the coat are able to perform tasks as diverse as playing the piano with two or more hands, to blocking attacks directed towards the wearer that otherwise would have been fatal. The limbs themselves are also varied, from normal-looking human limbs to tentacles and paws. The administrator only finally surrendered the coat to the Foundation in the end because it was taking up too much space in their closet, and presumably needed the room for the next season's most fashionable anomalous clothing. For centuries, though, you wouldn't see the administrator without the many-armed coat. That's right, centuries. Another almost universally accepted fact about the administrator is that they have a truly freakish longevity potentially living for hundreds of years. There has likely been more than one administrator during the Foundation's extremely long history, but each one has survived longer than any average human. It's also a widely believed theory that the administrator may have been a key player in the Foundation's initial creation, too. There's been a number of potential names speculated for the administrator, including Frederick Williams, Agnes Peterson, Kismet, and the sinister alias, the Spider. Some believe the administrator to be fundamentally human despite certain anomalous qualities, while others speculate that they're the furthest thing from human. This interpretation maintains that the administrator is an entity from a different dimension known as the plane where eyes can't follow, and has a freakish body made from a twisted charcoal-like material tangled with wire mesh and a chaos of different limbs, all hidden under SCP-262. But hey, the administrator species isn't nearly as interesting as their potential role within the Foundation. An issue surrounded with nearly as much confusion and controversy as, well, everything else about them. And just like everything else with the SCP Foundation, the line they feed the public is often different to the words circulating within the Foundation's higher clearance levels. If you want to believe the official stories, then the Administrator is the liaison between the Foundation and the numerous world governments that need to cooperate with them to ensure the successful capture of anomalies. The Administrator is only allowed to edit SCP files, not actually write them, due to apparent conflicts of interest. In many ways, the Administrator is presented as your typical sleazy Washington insider schmoozing with politicians and government figures to make sure they remain sympathetic to the Foundation's cause. According to observations from people outside the Foundation who've worked with the mysterious figure, they have a penchant for finely tailored suits, expensive aged liqueurs, and the amorous company of women. Despite being a bit of a drunken horndog, though, people tend to describe the administrator as likable and easy to get along with regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. They're also respected by many, and whenever something upsets them, even powerful world leaders are eager to try and appease them. Maybe because they are described as being freakishly strong when the situation demands it. Hey, even world leaders can change their minds when they have their arms twisted. 
literally. While there's nothing too outwardly bizarre about this iteration of the administrator, we don't actually know how much of this is true, a fact that really shouldn't surprise you by now. And if being well-versed in the world of SCPs has taught you anything, it's that the SCP Foundation's PR and disinformation teams are not to be trusted. So who can be trusted? Is there any perspective on this mysterious figure that can be taken reliably? The short answer is… no, not really. But we do have the next best thing. Recollections from some of the Foundation's most trusted researchers and personnel, and even some of the strange historical figures that have heard about or even run into the Administrator. What follows are some of their answers to the question, who is the Administrator? Professor Kane Pathos Crow said, Oh, he's just something people talk about over lunch or when they're in between assignments. It kills time, and it's a fun game to speculate on who really calls the shots in this crazy world. Field agent Fritz Willy said, I like to tell people he's my brother. Foundation researcher Dr. Snorlison said, I'd like to poke at him and see what happens, just to see if any of the rumors about being made entirely of legs and toes are true, or something like that at least. Director Neil Ghost said, No big deal, son. The ever-stoic Dr. Charles Gears said, There are no records of anyone by that name working for the Foundation. Dr. Iceberg said, Whatever the boss man says goes. I'm not on staff to care about last decade's rumors. Dr. Glass said, I never met the guy. I heard he's pretty interesting, though. I'd love to sit down and have a chat with him, but he's probably too busy. I've never even gotten a call back about it. The wildcard Dr. Alto Clef said, Who? Dr. Chelsea Elliott said, I've actually done some research on him. Earliest records are about 60 years ago, and beyond that there's some vague references to a leader. Most of the records, though, are incomplete or just references by name, not much of substance. Dr. Frederick Hayden said, Please leave me alone. Dr. Jack Bright said, Yeah, I've heard the guy you're talking about. He's just a legendary thing from way back in the day. When we thought there were 1205s, we said he was there to be the tiebreaker. People don't talk about him much now anymore, probably because we don't need icons like that to keep people together. Dr. Jacob Kensington said, I think he bought me lunch once? Dr. Wright said, I heard he lives up in a big tower at Overwatch and he watches down on the O5s from the back of a mighty scaled dragon and he flies the skies for free. Uh, or something like that. You'll have to wait until I finish the book to hear the whole story. Dr. Kondraki said, Well, we can't tell you exactly what he said, but it was short and to the point and he was later disciplined for his use of rather rude language. In an interview later suppressed by the SCP Foundation, acclaimed horror writer Stephen King said of his interaction with the administrator, One of the oddest things to happen to me out on the road was an autograph session in Westbrook, I think. A larger gentleman approached the table with a copy of The Stand, said he was a big fan. Now, I think I might have been a little crazy here, but when I looked at his hand holding the book, it was green. I asked if he was okay, and I looked up into his eyes. They were green, too. He said he was fine. It was... Pretty scary stuff. Dr. Tilda D. Moose said, No. No, I don't even think we humor that one anymore. It's like the mid-tier research staff telling the new people there's a pool on the third floor. Nobody really believes it, but a couple people every year try and ask just to, uh, check. But yes, it's, uh, more or less dead rumor. And Dr. Django Bridge said, Sure, I know him. He hangs out at the pool on the fifth floor. So we return to our original question. Who is the administrator? Do they rule the SCP Foundation or serve it? Are they an anomalous human or a straight-up monster? Are they a liquor-loving political schmoozer greasing the palms of the world's government? Or a mysterious demigod who founded the Foundation and guides it on its quest to contain the anomalous and protect normality? The fact is, we don't know. And thanks to Foundation misinformation campaigns, we may never know. But much like the anti-meme, the administrator is defined as much by what we don't know as what we do. And according to all sources, that's exactly how they like it. But what do you think is the truth about the administrator? Just who exactly is lurking under that coat, if anyone at all? Cunning, liar, enigmatic, and fearsome are just a few words used to describe a particular member of the SCP Foundation. While many of the Foundation's researchers and scientists are a pretty unusual bunch, to say the least, this one might just take the cake, and then might have said cake decommissioned in the most collaterally damaging way imaginable. 
similar to the infamous Dr. Bright always switching bodies, appearing with all manner of ever-shifting faces, genders, and even species. This particular Foundation Department head is also no stranger to never looking the same way twice. In his case, he can't be photographed properly, at least not by any conventional means. Thanks to some unknown anomalous augmentation, any pictures taken of this researcher will have the face swapped with that of a random animal. However, these pictures will always feature the same characteristic grin much like the smile of a Cheshire cat, a notorious liar not to be trusted by anyone. Dr. Alto Clef is one of the SCP Foundation's strangest members of personnel. For starters, Dr. Alto Clef isn't even technically his real name, more a nickname that became synonymous with the mysterious scientist and served as a convenient shorthand for his alleged real name. You see, according to the entity most commonly known as Dr. Clef, his real name is actually a sound unpronounceable by human beings. His name is, apparently, the A major chord played on a ukulele. This explains why the strange doctor always carries the instrument around with him, should anyone wish to refer to him using his real name on a strum of those strings. In fact, he used to go by a completely different name, the Ukulele Man, and sometimes Agent Ukulele, thanks to his predilection for playing the string instrument. So where did the Alto Clef nickname come from? Well, that one's easy. Dr. Clef received this nickname thanks to his penchant for signing off reports with a hand-drawn Alto Clef symbol, a type of musical note. Dr. Clef had long been one of the more enigmatic and mysterious scientists working at the Foundation. He is perhaps more of an oddity than the elusive and infamous O5 Council themselves although that one is probably up for debate. Alto Clef was formerly an operative for the Global Occult Coalition, although he first attracted the attention of the SCP Foundation a while before then. A number of research papers Clef published at a redacted university happened to catch the Foundation's eye, mostly for their bizarre and lurid subject matter. Much of the content and even the title of some of his works are redacted, but what we do know is that one of Clef's papers describes certain traits that matched an existing SCP they had cataloged in their archive. There was no way this could have been a coincidence. Somehow Alto Clef had knowledge of the anomalous and had to be considered a potential risk to security. During a conversation with the agent that was sent to investigate his strange research papers, Alto Clef was able to convince her to offer him a job within the Foundation. It seems exceptionally unusual that Clef was able to pull this off, as most women working for the SCP Foundation have reported that the man possesses a positively slimy personality. So, why even bother to hire this guy if he seems to be such a creep? Well, it turned out that the acquisition of Dr. Clef wasn't without its advantages namely the capture and containment of SCP-447. This SCP, for anyone who might be unfamiliar, is an anomaly in two parts. The first, SCP-447-1, is a sphere composed entirely of a green, slime-like substance. It's warm to the touch, the same sort of heat as an ordinary human body, and has no adverse or harmful effects on anyone that comes into contact with it. SCP-447-2 is a viscous green slime that is excreted by the main ball. This excretion can be eaten or can increase the fuel efficiency of gasoline by 150% when they are mixed. The sphere and the substance are only known to be harmful when they come into contact with dead bodies, although what exactly occurs when this happens has been redacted by the O5 Council. Nonetheless, Dr. Alto Clef was reportedly instrumental in retrieving SCP-447, and given the usefulness of its slime to the Foundation, the doctor had, in turn, proved his own worth. The consensus seems to be that, while his personality might be annoying or even outright repulsive in some instances, Alto Clef is still able to perform his job with precision and competence, making the doctor a useful asset to the SCP Foundation. During his time there, Clef became well known for being somewhat of a gun enthusiast as well. In fact, he earned his own brand of infamy for his habit of brutally decommissioning dangerous SCPs, and you can probably guess what we mean by that. In other words, Clef established himself as the Foundation's go-to executioner. Sometimes he's a little too good at his job, though. In one instance, Clef brought a chainsaw to work that he thought possessed supernatural properties, 
However, this happened to take place at the Foundation's annual costume party, causing the Doctor to think that a riot was taking place, thanks to personnel all being dressed as D-Class. Chainsaw in hand, Clef murdered half of his own research staff without a second thought. It also turned out that the chainsaw hadn't had any anomalous properties in the first place. That was an HR nightmare. Dr. Clef is renowned for having brutal efficiency, not shying away from causing the deaths of countless civilian lives during his decommissioning of anomalies. As long as he is able to kill or contain an SCP to further the course of science, or protect the majority of the civilian world, then Clef will view any possible deaths and collateral damage caused by his actions as acceptable losses. In short, he is a necessary evil. But perhaps Clef's best-known attempt at decommissioning an anomaly was during the SCP-239 incident, also known by the nickname of the Witch Child. SCP-239 might appear to be a harmless eight-year-old child, but she's actually a powerful reality-bending anomaly with impervious, indestructible skin. Her capabilities are almost limitless and she can influence the world and people around her in virtually any way that she can imagine. As long as she is conscious and can see her surroundings, SCP-239 can create living matter or make it disappear, wishing things into or out of existence with as little as a simple thought. Or as her file in the SCP archive puts it, if she can see it, she can change it. Although SCP-239 was being contained by the Foundation, given a pre-approved list of spells that she was allowed to perform and kept calm at all times so she wouldn't think to cause harm to herself or anyone around her, Dr. Clef didn't think that this was adequate enough. In a report, he claimed that the Witch Child's containment wasn't suitable and that she posed a major security risk to the SCP Foundation and its personnel. You see, given his time with the Global Occult Coalition, Dr. Clef had become somewhat of an expert in anomalies with the ability to reshape reality, making him particularly wary of SCP-239. It was his proposal that the Foundation should not overestimate its own ability to contain these reality benders and that they should instead strike first. Dr. Clef's idea was simple. Use some form of sharp implement to kill SCP-239. Of course, given the Witch Child's impenetrable skin, this is a lot easier said than done. But Clef had a few solutions handy to work around this. Firstly, his plan was that this decommissioning would be carried out at night when SCP-239 was asleep, and as a result, her reality-altering powers would be neutralized. Second, the implement used to kill her would be made out of SCP-148, the Telekill Alloy. This anomaly is a metal that the Foundation keeps stored in blocks that has the unique property of being able to block telepathic and mimetic effects. Now that plan on its own might sound fine on paper. That is, if you're on board with murdering an eight-year-old SCP while she's asleep, you monster. But there were a number of risks for Clef to consider. SCP-239 could wake up during her termination and would then be able to resist being killed. But another far more complicated risk was that SCP-239 could wake up, perceive the person carrying out her termination as a friend, as someone who wouldn't harm her, and her abilities would then alter the world around her to make this the case, changing reality to match. To try and avoid this outcome, Dr. Clef volunteered himself as the one who would carry out the procedure. With his mysterious past, dealing with reality-changing anomalies as a member of the Global Occult Coalition, he overzealously thought he was the only man cut out for the job. However, in his arrogance, Clef made the fatal mistake of transmitting his plan openly to Foundation personnel, instead of using secure encrypted channels. You see, over time, SCP-239 had formed bonds with a number of the Site-17 staff that had been assigned to her. Regardless of whether staff members had sympathy towards the girl, or because her perception of them had altered reality and bent their intentions, Dr. Kondraki had to step in and intervene. And, of course, this led to an altercation between the two. Thanks to Kondraki's efforts, Dr. Clef's proposed plan of decommissioning SCP-239, a defenseless, anomalous child, was thwarted. Even so, during the incident, Clef showed how remarkably and worryingly easy he found it to outwit the Foundation's defenses and security forces. Though he walked away from his attempted murder of SCP-239 with a few severe injuries, Clef's career wasn't impeded upon in the slightest. In fact, the O5 Council promoted him to the position of department head for the SCP Foundation's Division of Training and Development, 
thanks to his reputation for swift, relentless, and surgically precise methods of terminating SCPs. However, Dr. Clef's actions during the SCP-239 incident prompted some within the Foundation to take a closer look at his past. A tricky thing to do, especially seeing as Clef is known to be a liar and not someone to be trusted, and that this has been a long-time habit of his that is unlikely to change. However, there does exist a service record for a global occult coalition operative who used to go by the codename of Ukulele. First recruited into the coalition in 1981, Ukulele was reported to have killed a number of known threat entities, or KTEs, but these usually came with the result of heavy casualties, including the deaths of other GOC operatives. One Colonel Richard Adams is quoted in Ukulele's service record as saying, Does anyone know who this guy is or where he came from? He's good at what he does, right, but every time I ask him about his past, I get a completely different answer. Eventually, after 99 confirmed kills of anomalous entities, the operative known as Ukulele expressed a desire to return from active service within the Coalition. This request was granted, and sometime later he resurfaced working for the SCP Foundation under a new name, Dr. Alto Clef. Naturally, Dr. Clef has never confirmed nor denied that he is, in fact, Ukulele, although his habit of playing the instrument does seem to imply that there is some sort of connection there. After all, that's not as strange as some of the other rumors floating around about our old friend Alto Clef. Some think he's an incarnation of the devil himself, or that he even married a goddess and had several children with her. Others claim Clef is the biological father of SCP-166 a girl with deer horns and the ability to make anything man-made corrode. Then again, you'd be better off coming up with your own answer than asking Dr. Clef about his past. He's hardly likely to give you a straight answer, providing he doesn't accidentally kill you on the spot. Congratulations! You've just entered the employ of the SCP Foundation as a junior researcher. As you know, the Foundation doesn't just hand out positions like this to anyone. To get scouted as part of their research corps, you need to be one of the best and brightest. You're going to be working with strange, mind-bending, and sometimes even deadly anomalies on a daily basis. You're part of the thin, redacted line between normalcy and absolute chaos of the supernatural. But right now, only one question is on your mind. Where will you actually be working? Because here's the thing. The SCP Foundation is a worldwide organization devoted to the containment of the anomalous, and they have thousands of classified sites and areas across the globe, each of them specializing in a different subset of the strange. Depending on your particular area of expertise, there's a number of Foundation facilities you may hope to be assigned to, but that's not what we're talking about today. Instead, we're focusing on the sites and areas so dangerous that just getting assigned there feels kind of like a demotion to D-Class, the places with the deadliest anomalies and the most frightening locales. That's right. It's time to cross your fingers and hope for the best. Because today, we're going to discuss the most dangerous SCP Foundation sites and areas. But first, there are some things we need to understand about Foundation facilities in general. If you're somewhat familiar with the world of the SCP Foundation, you've probably heard phrases like research site and biological containment area thrown around a lot. You may have even picked up most of the meanings from context clues. But before we throw you into even more dangerous, uncharted waters, we're going to break down the labels for you. The Foundation has secure facilities all over the world, and they deal with a wide range of different anomalies, so these facilities often have to specialize to suit the requirements of their specific task. For starters, the terms site and area aren't interchangeable. Sites are covert Foundation facilities that often exist relatively close to civilian populations, so as not to arouse suspicion from the public or rival groups like the Chaos Insurgency. They disguise themselves as boring government and corporate buildings. Areas, on the other hand, typically have to contain much more dangerous anomalies. Areas tend to not only be much larger than sites, they're also further away from civilian population centers. There's no cover story here. The areas are just entirely hidden. They also often have some pretty crazy failsafe measures in case of a large containment breach, like one or even multiple thermonuclear warheads designed to detonate and blow the facility to kingdom come, if things ever get truly out of control. It goes without saying that you'd probably rather be assigned to a site rather than an area, 
if you're risk adverse. Both types of facilities are divided into sections or sectors, which in some cases are further divided into units. Units typically are small, high-security areas devoted to the extensive containment of a single anomaly or several closely related anomalies. Now that you know the two types of facilities, let's talk prefixes. The handy little descriptor that often clues you in to how a Foundation site or area has specialized. There are 10 possible prefixes for a facility, and we'll take you on a quick crash course through those before we start getting dangerous. Armed, as in arm site, armed area, or armed section, refers to a facility or section that possesses a large quantity of firepower and could mean military-grade weaponry, vehicles, or just a large number of permanent armed guards. Armed facilities tend to be more dangerous to work in, either due to a greater threat of containment breach or due to a high possibility of attacks from the outside. Biological or bio implies that the facility or area deals with infectious or biohazardous anomalies that would make catching the Black Plague feel like a spa day. Containment is an obvious one. These sites or areas that are, you guessed it, built for containing anomalies. Dimensional containment facilities or sections often contain dangerous pocket dimensions or gateways into other dimensions. Humanoid containment facilities or sections deal largely with intelligent human or human-like anomalies, capable of understanding and following instructions. They're similar to standard prisons, but for anomalous people. Protected facilities and sections are anomaly-free safe zones, so we won't be discussing them much here. Provisional facilities are typically temporary facilities built around an anomaly that couldn't be feasibly transported to a pre-existing facility. The rare reliquary facilities or sections are designed to hold anomalous artifacts of a religious or historical nature. Research facilities or sections either research the anomalies themselves or work on devising new containment methods. And storage facilities are designed to store non-anomalous items long-term. The Foundation also has observation outposts, but, with some rare exceptions, your greatest risk at one of these is dying of boredom. With that out of the way, let's get to what we've all been waiting for. The scariest, deadliest, and most overall dangerous facilities on the Foundation roster. The places you'd never want to be assigned to if your life depended on it. And in this case, it really does. First, we'll discuss the most dangerous sites, and then the most dangerous areas. So grab your Foundation-issued sidearm, and let's go. First, Site 19. It shouldn't be surprised that the largest operating Foundation site is also the one containing some of the most famous and deadly prisoners. Two in particular are the one you can't look away from, and another that puts you in lifelong mortal danger if you look at it. These are SCP-173 The Sculpture and SCP-689 The Statue of Death. If you get assigned to Site-19, there's a possibility you may suddenly find yourself with a snapped neck while filling in spreadsheets. And if you so much take a glance at SCP-689, you'll be declared an E-Class, and possibly even terminated by your superiors. Second Provisional Site-4511, home of SCP-4511 also known as the Swine God. This giant pig-shaped furnace has had a terrifying effect on the Foundation personnel stationed at the site. In just a few weeks, it had seemingly rational researchers and guards performing brutal sacrifices in its name and ascending into an occult hell. It's happened at least once already and is extremely likely to happen again, so you definitely want to avoid being deployed here. But the most deadly site of all is one that doesn't even come from our universe. Site 13, also known as SCP-1730. This site, run by director Elliot Emerson, functioned like an anomaly slaughterhouse in another dimension. Anomalies were murdered and burned, and dissenting Foundation employees were treated horrifically. But when Director Emerson happened to turn on the reality-warping Thresher machine, this site became a full-blown nightmare filled with escaped SCPs, memetic hazards, otherworldly nightmare gods, and a truly unsavory entity nicknamed Leech Boy, who is quite interested in drinking your blood. If you can even survive long enough in Site-13 to meet him, that is. 
Of course, it's the secure foundation areas where the horrors really unfold. These can make some of the worst sites look mild in comparison. Let's take a look at some of the foundation's most dangerous areas. First, Containment Area 25B. This area is not only 200 meters beneath the ocean, it's also one of the most heavily fortified and one of the few to actually detonate its on-site nuclear warhead in the past. That's because this is the containment area for SCP-076, also known as ABLE. This anomaly has frequent and extreme violent containment breach attempts, often brutally slaughtering staff in the process with his deft swordsmanship. Accepting a job here is a great way to fast-track yourself into becoming human sushi. Next up is Area 354. This facility houses SCP-354, also known as the Blood Pond, a slowly expanding pool of red liquid that habitually unleashes dangerous monsters that attack the guards stationed there. These include giant bats, huge metal spheres releasing concentrated radiation beams, a giant reptilian humanoid impervious to gunfire, and an invisible robotic Terminator entity that managed to murder 90% of the attending guards before being killed itself. In other words, not a recipe for stable employment. Area 126 is dangerous for a number of reasons. First, that it's located inside war-torn Damascus, Syria, and thus sometimes come under threat from shelling operations. Second, because it contains SCP-3989. This spatial anomaly in the middle of an olive orchard turned out to be a front for a terrifying sarcic dimension full of fleshy abominations. What's more, simply being in this area slowly caused the staff to lose their minds and become devoted to the sarcic deities hidden within the dimension. And much like the Blood Pond, it's believed that this area of influence is actively growing day by day. Meaning if you work at Area 126, it's actually getting less safe with each moment that passes. Next, Arm Reliquary and Containment Area 02. This base is specifically designed to contain highly dangerous, hostile, or otherwise hazardous anomalies, including multiple Keter-class objects. And we're not kidding when we say dangerous and hostile. The anomalies housed on this site are so dangerous, there's a literal battalion of armed guards to keep the peace. It also has not one, but multiple fail-safe nuclear weapons, designed to literally erase the entire base from existence if ever there's a catastrophic containment breach. One particularly horrifying anomaly in Area 02 is SCP-743. This is a seemingly innocent chocolate fountain that actually contains billions of extremely violent ant-like creatures that will swarm anything nearby, tearing it to pieces and dragging the pieces back to their nest inside the fountain. These insects will stop at nothing and can even tear through titanium if they need to in order to get their desired sustenance. So being present in this area means your life is constantly at risk. Hope you like chocolate. Next is the dreaded Armed Biological Containment Area 14, which contains some of the deadliest biological anomalies out there. From the bloodthirsty, kill-crazed Heart of Darkness SCP-058, to the head-devouring cannibal giant SCP-082, to the voice-imitating, memory-wiping, red-pack hunters SCP-939. This base also houses several fast-breeding killer parasites and a few highly infectious and deadly diseases. While Area 14 does boast an entire army of guards with heavy military hardware for preventing all these terrifying monsters from breaching containment and causing havoc, that probably won't make you feel much better. If even one of these things escapes at any given time, you better hope for your family's sake that you have a good life insurance policy. And finally, Area 37. As it stands, being sent to this area pretty much guarantees either death or a fate even worse than dying. That's because Area 37 is no longer under the control of the SCP Foundation. Instead, it's become a twisted playground for SCP-1765, a trio of terrifying reality warpers known as the Sisters. These unstoppable monsters claimed the area as their own, and began performing sickening experiments such as being forced into maddening time loops designed to drive you insane, or being crushed and burned to death in deadly games with confusing rules. While heading into other areas offers the possibility of a gruesome fate, 
Area 37 offers a dead certainty. Now, not only do you know the difference between different types of sites and areas, you now know some of the most horrifying and deadly examples of each, so you know which to avoid. But look on the bright side. If you're hard up for work and the SCP Foundation seems like an appealing job, at least you know there will likely always be a position available at one of these sites. After all, positions here open up very frequently. You're a member of an elite mobile task force, tracking down an anomaly in a rural village somewhere in the Swiss Alps that was recently detected by SCP Foundation field agents. According to all the current intel, you're dealing with a particularly deadly and hard-to-contain monster. A shape-shifting entity that can kill with a touch and assume the form of anyone it kills. If this thing somehow escaped the village and broke into a major population center, it could blend in perfectly and cause death on a massive scale. It's up to you and your team to get this creature secured and contained before that can happen. You're going in heavily armed, with advanced sensory technology and several attack helicopters, each one loaded with plenty of powerful missiles. One way or another, you're putting a stop to this thing. But the best laid plans of Mobile Task Force agents go often awry. The mission is a bloodbath. The shape-shifting anomaly has blended in perfectly with the innocent civilians living in the village. Before you know it, half of your team have been killed, and you don't know which of the remaining team members are really themselves. This really couldn't have gone worse, and if you mess this up, not only is your life at risk, but so are the lives of everyone this anomaly happens to get close to. All of your superiors were killed or transformed in the battle with the shapeshifter, and you're now sitting at the top of your MTF's chain of command. The way you see it, there's only one option. You radio up to air support, alerting the several attack choppers circling the village. You tell them to rain fire and destroy the whole place. That's the only way to be sure to take out the anomaly. Things have gone beyond the point of easy containment. You sprint past the village limits as the volley of missiles and firebombs raise the formerly quiet settlement to the ground. Other than the task force members in the helicopters, you're the only survivor. Over 320 people are dead. But on the upside, the remains of the shape-shifting anomaly were found amongst the rubble by Foundation personnel. You prevented whatever horrors it would have caused if it had been allowed to escape. Mission accomplished. But it's not over yet. When you solemnly return to the containment site you've been deployed from, your superiors order you to go pay a visit to Conference Room 2. You correctly assume that it's some kind of disciplinary meeting, maybe the site director chewing you out for shoddy work, but ultimately congratulating you for doing what needed to be done under pressure. After all, making the tough decisions is what working for the SCP Foundation is all about. But when you arrive in the conference room, you're sitting across from a woman you've never seen before. She's tall, with hard, stern-looking features, and a plain but well-tailored suit. Despite being a hardened soldier on the Foundation payroll, something about this woman makes you nervous. She smiles and says, Hello, I'm with the Foundation Ethics Committee. We need to have a word. For reasons you don't quite understand, you start to break into a cold sweat. The Ethics Committee? I thought they just existed to scare Foundation employees. I didn't know they had actual authority. But that's where you made a terrible mistake. And from the tight smile on the agent's face, you can tell that the Foundation Ethics Committee has a lot more power than you've ever imagined. Perhaps you know them from the jokes that float around the Foundation circles. How many members of the Ethics Committee does it take to change a light bulb? None! The Ethics Committee can't change anything! Perhaps you heard about the O5 Council's disdain for them. Those bureaucratic pencil pushers with all their rubber stamps and red tape. The jokes don't seem so funny now, though. The Ethics Committee representative clears her throat and tells you that you've been reassigned, effective immediately. You're now under the employ of the Foundation Ethics Committee, and this change is non-negotiable. You try to state your case in blind panic. Part of you thinks that being reassigned to the Ethics Committee after the mistake you just made is code for being taken into a windowless room and shot in the back of your head. But the agent insists that really isn't the case. The Ethics Committee hates codes and euphemisms. They don't say terminated, they say killed. Because at the Ethics Committee, clarity of language is extremely important. They don't sanitize any horrific acts that need to be performed for the sake of containment. 
After all, it's their job to look these horrors in the face and give the final yes or no on whether they're carried out. As you may know, the SCP Foundation is essentially above all external law. No government, no organization, and no individual can tell them what to do. The 13 members of the O5 Council have almost unlimited knowledge at their disposal, as well as technology that the rest of the world could only ever dream of. With a setup like that, it would be easy to give in to corruption and go mad with power. If they wanted to, they could abandon their mission of protecting humanity from the shadows and instead rule the world with an iron fist. That's where the all-important role of the Foundation Ethics Committee comes in. As Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Just as the O5 Council wields the power, the Ethics Committee wields the responsibility. They remind the whole organization that they are here to serve the world, not the other way around. Think of them as the conscience of the SCP Foundation. They decide what's morally acceptable for the Foundation to do in pursuit of its goals, to make sure that those who fight monsters don't become monsters themselves. As Nietzsche famously said, if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Right now, you very much feel like you're staring into the abyss, as the Ethics Committee representative calmly explains the situation to you. An important thing to remember about the Foundation is that it must be cold, not cruel. The second that the harm it causes is in excess of the positive results of the Foundation's actions, it's time for the Ethics Committee to step in and dole out some discipline. It is the Ethics Committee's job to balance the moral cost of every action performed by the Foundation, from the degree of collateral damage permissible in the field to the ways that D-classes can be ethically used in testing. While some hardcore Foundation loyalists may say that people like the Ethics Committee are standing in the way of true progress, giving yourself wholly to the mission without any ethical safeguards can be a dangerous line to walk. At that point, what's separating the Foundation from the Global Occult Coalition or the Chaos Insurgency? Or even worse, their nightmarish alternate selves from the universe of SCP-1730 and SCP-5000. While the Foundation occasionally needs to do some truly horrific things in order to secure, contain, and protect, it is the Ethics Committee that keeps them on the moral high ground. All of this seems pretty complicated to you, as you sit, still fearing for your life in Conference Room 2. The Ethics Committee agent mm. explains that it's actually all quite simple once you get used to it. The Ethics Committee uses a moral framework known as utilitarianism. Think of it like the product of morality and math. Specifically, the Committee uses an ethical system known as negative utilitarianism. This system revolves around the principle of harm reduction. The Committee tries to modify every action taken to cause the least amount of possible suffering in a situation, the goal being to eliminate any unnecessary suffering from action. Take your decision, for example, the Ethics Committee representative says. Your actions, namely the destruction of the village, caused a great deal of suffering. However, considering the damage the anomaly could have caused after your team lost control of the situation, it's clear that your motivation was ultimately pure harm reduction. I admire that kind of thinking in a high-pressure situation. You feel a cool wave of relief wash over you. It feels safe to assume at this point that this probably isn't just a big front for your immediate termination. The agent sitting across from you seems to sense that that's what you're thinking and assures you that she's being nothing but honest with you. The ethics committee has no need to be petty. They know everything, after all. And that's not an exaggeration. Their clearance is basically the equivalent to level 5, the highest in the Foundation. Every line ever redacted from an SCP Foundation file, they were privy to. Every secret the Foundation has ever kept, they have absolute access to. And every decision the Foundation has ever made, the Ethics Committee has always had the final say, with veto power even over the O5 Council. And most importantly, all members of the Ethics Committee are former Foundation personnel, site directors, researchers, mobile task force operatives, all people whose decisions have caused pain and death. Much like jury duty, the responsibility is random and non-negotiable. 
what you're experiencing right now isn't a normal disciplinary hearing. It's an employee orientation. The cruel irony for a department of the foundation devoted to ethical conduct is that it's actually complicit in pretty much all of the foundation's worst moral crimes. After all, every action that the foundation has ever performed has been performed with the permission and cooperation of the Ethics Committee. Take the infamous Procedure 110 Montauk used to prevent the victims of SCP-231 giving birth. The Ethics Committee had a key role in designing the horrific procedure, and now they have to live with the soul-crushing knowledge of exactly what that procedure entails. And soon, you will too. Just one of the many perks of joining the committee. It isn't the easiest job, the representative tells you. She's got the steely blank eyes of someone who has seen some things that people were never meant to see. She continues, Before we conclude the first part of your orientation, I suppose I should tell you about the sowing circle. That'll give you a good idea of what you're in for. She tells you that the sowing circle was the anomaly discussed in the 2017 Ethics Committee Roundtable. It's an anomaly so secretive that it was never given an official containment number or classification, but it was proposed as a solution to one of the Foundation's most nightmarish problems, the shortage of human infants. It is an ugly truth about the Foundation that a decent number of anomalies, such as SCP-2845 the Deer, require the sacrifice of live children as part of their containment procedures. For years, the Foundation has been stealing children from orphanages for the use in these rituals, but the Sowing Circle could solve this problem. It was a mummified human corpse, wreathed in a circle of its own dried-out intestines. The mummy produced seeds which, if consumed, could allow human women to produce litters of 12 babies with an 8-hour gestation period, like the litters of a sow, hence the name. This would solve the baby shortage handily. It was the job of the Ethics Committee to decide what would be the most ethical way to use this anomaly. In the end, despite their own personal moral disgust at the actions, their philosophy of harm reduction led them to one conclusion. Using the device to impregnate already brain-dead patients, effectively turning them into comatose infant factories whose only purpose was to be used in horrific containment procedures. But ultimately, the sacrifice would pale compared to the pain averted, seeing as millions, if not billions, would be under threat from some of these entities being released. Not that this makes the knowledge of what needs to be done any easier to handle on a personal level, but of course, after what you did at the village, you know this feeling all too well already. The pain and the guilt you felt at making that decision is going to follow you your whole life. And now, you're about to have countless more experiences piled on top. It's your burden, your duty, your job. The Ethics Committee agent forces a weak smile. She says, of course, nobody said the job was easy, but somebody needs to do it. It almost goes without saying that the inner workings of the SCP Foundation are kept secret from the general population. Your average Joe doesn't need or want to know about the terrifying entities and bizarre experiments happening behind the closed doors of the various Foundation research sites. But there are some secrets of the SCP Foundation that even its own staff know very little about. One such mystery is the highly classified and immensely powerful O5 Council, or Overwatch Council, that oversees everything that goes on within the SCP Foundation. They are considered the highest authority within the organization, but very little is known about them. In fact, according to one official report in the SCP Foundation archives, the O5 Council does not exist at all. Stick with me here. There are decades of reports concerning the Council. There is a wealth of historical evidence pointing to their existence and influence, but they do not definitively exist. At least, they don't right now. Take a deep breath, try and untangle the knots we just tied in your brain, sit back, and listen. This is the story of SCP-001, the O5 Council itself. In 1965, SCP Foundation Administrator William Cohen was preparing to leave his position. To prepare his successor, H. V. Oleander, Administer Cohen drafted a series of letters intended to pass on important and highly guarded knowledge to the man who would take his place. In the letter, Administrator Cohen explained that he was retiring early for a specific reason, writing, A dark lynch to my mind. 
sticking to every neuron and slowing my every thought. In truth, I am unwell. Cohen's decline had begun eight years prior, in late 1957, after the launch of Soviet space probe Sputnik 1 into the Earth's orbit. The Foundation's interest had been drawn to the probe after a foreign signal had been detected trying to communicate with it. Not a signal from a foreign nation, mind you, but something from much further away, and likely something that was not human. Whatever it was, it was trying to communicate, and it was getting closer. On January 4th, 1958, the signal stopped and an unidentified object arrived on Earth. Cohn was summoned to the war room at Site 00 much to his surprise. It was highly unusual for guests to be invited to the site. There they worked together to identify the nature of the situation with Sputnik, until a single burst of gamma radiation was detected and Sputnik's orbit began to decay. The Council panicked, calling heads of state and calling for as many resources as possible. They had worked themselves into a frenzy and were planning to shoot down the first space probe in Earth's history. Eventually, the decision was placed in Cohen's hands. Let the probe land on its own or shoot it down. Overwhelmed by the Council's intensity, Cohen told them to do what they thought was best. They shot it down. He did not want to, but he crumbled under the pressure. There were so many of them and only one of him, and they seemed so certain in their decision. This was the first decision in his career that Cohen regretted, and it was presumably followed by many more. He continued in his letter saying, And now what credibility do I have left to disagree with them? I am but a mouthpiece, a sad old puppet tangled up and caught in the very strings used to make him dance. Cohen wrote his letter to his successor with one warning. Just as I have shown you vulnerability here in the hopes I might gain your trust, Please consider asking the same from those who would insist you trust them. In March of 1958, following the incident with Sputnik, the O5 Council collectively submitted a notice to the Foundation's Leadership Committee. They stated simply, The individual you call your administrator has proven insufficient. We solicit you to make your preparations and nominate another. No individual members of the Council wrote in but rather submitted their thoughts as a collective, as if thinking together as one single mind. The language used was also curious, saying, your administrator, rather than our administrator. The O5 Council seemed to think of itself as something separate from the SCP Foundation, its own entity rather than simply a powerful arm or leader of the organization itself. On June 11, 1962, another notice was sent out. It read, Foundation, a life lived in service of the greater good is invalidated if death does not also serve. On November 11, 1965, a third notice was sent out, this time to all Foundation staff. Please join us in remembering the life and career of Administrator William Cohen. The only constant is change. Because of this, the erosion of his skills, abilities, knowledge, and confidence was inevitable. Administrator H. V. Oleander took over the position for many years after Cohen's demise. In 1988, he prepared to step down and drafted a letter to his successor, Natalia Ellingbrook. Like Cohen before him, Oleander tried his best to explain where he went wrong, in the hope that she might do better. Oleander began the letter, I used to have such an ego. This job, this life, and the burdens that surround it crush and squeeze you until all you have left is what they force you to keep. My mind and my soul feel as though they've been contorted into the shape of someone I no longer recognize. My predecessor, may he rest in peace, described his years as if he were trapped behind smoky glass and made to watch a foggy world pass him by. Like some sort of voyeur, I too feel imprisoned but I realized that it was never a looking glass. It is a mirror. The events detailed in the letter began in November of 1985, after a powerful storm had ripped through New England and caused severe damage to Site-31's power grid. During the power outage, a multi-stage containment breach occurred and an unnamed Infovor escaped from the facility. The entity was lost until March of 1986, when it was detected in a government facility in Warsaw, Poland. Determined to make up for his previous failure, Oleander organized a mission to bring the entity back into custody. His team tracked it down and was prepared to apprehend the entity's host, 
when the O5 Council expressed concern that this behavior might cause an international incident and intervened. The Council made the decision to reach out to local and international governments in Poland, allowing the entity to escape to Pripyat, Ukraine. Oleander and the Council went head-to-head -head on this, pushing and pulling and becoming increasingly aggressive on either side. Oleander could not make up his mind about what to do, listen to the Council, or trust his own gut. On April 26, 1986, his indecision resulted in a nuclear disaster in Soviet territory. Not only that, but the entity still evaded containment. The mission was a complete failure. The O5 Council submitted a report on the incident stating, We recommended that the healing process commence by first assigning blame. The collective good would be served by purging liability. And we would have helped. Anyone would have helped. Why deny it? By now, the pattern has probably become clear to you. The administrator and the council fall into conflict over a difficult decision. Something goes horribly wrong, a new administrator is chosen, the former administrator writes them a letter to prepare them for the heavy demands of the job, and the cycle begins again. As you might expect during those days of her administration, Oleander's replacement, Natalie Ellingbrook, sat down to write a letter of warning to one Michelle Wilkies who was chosen to replace her. Ellingbrook began her letter. As you've likely surmised from our few meetings, I walk with a pronounced limp and favor my left leg. How I came to be like this isn't especially interesting, but what it did to me might be of interest to a person in your position. Any man or woman changes when they are exposed to pain. Simply put, it has to go somewhere. If you hold it all within yourself, it may stay contained, but it will surely destroy you when you've had your fill. It festers in all the spaces you let it occupy, warping and scarring what used to be healthy, happy tissue sat beneath. Some people have hobbies, but me, I've always just had my work. I've been ringside for so much pain in my time with the Foundation. My predecessor left me a note, much like I am leaving you, and in it he warned me of the tremendous duty and guilt he hid in order to do his job. Although the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune stung him quite keenly, I assure you I have suffered every bit his equal. The breach at the Olympics in 94, losing control of Site 248 in 96, botched facility transfer of Hong Kong in 97, bombings in Bali in 02, the dispute with the ORIA in the Congo in 03, the GOC ultimatum in 04. She continued, Although I have weathered much, my tenure is up not with the sort of precipitating bang that ousted Oleander, but rather the quiet whimper of stepping away from a battle I no longer wish to fight. I am tired of the council calling a meeting on every decision I try to make, and I am tired of calling one on every decision they try to make without me. I guess that reasoning is another tribute to the selfish life I have led. My ideal way to say goodbye would have been to simply stop coming in. My desk would have sat empty, emails unread, until one day a courier showed up with my keys and badge. But even here, at the end of my career, the O5 Council insists on refusing to let me be by myself. So tomorrow I will play the part of a dutiful officer resigning her post and walk away from Site 00 with my head held high and those overbearing bastards in the rearview mirror. I pray that your head will never be so bowed as mine has. Administrator Wilkies took her predecessor's words to heart and began her tenure with a new proposal for Project Tethys. The project would include modifications to the Three Gorges Dam Facility at the Yangtze River. As part of a containment procedure for Entity 2005-C-ET-011, the Council refused to approve her proposal. Administrator Wilkies insisted that they provide a list of concerns, explaining what their issues with their proposal were. The two argued back and forth over the necessity of a meeting until the Council submitted this note to her. We know how important it is to get off on the right foot. Although this body respects you and the autonomy which you command, we have also seen many come and go. You were chosen from your peers, but they have chosen many others in the past. We remain unconvinced. Before you, Allingbrook, who spent her whole life pushing others aside so she could lead. She left all others behind. Trees with no roots do not hold to the ground. Before her, Oleander, who wanted so much to be seen as your hero in white. He could no longer live with himself once his clothes were stained, but the sin does not define the saint. Before him, Cohen, 
who wanted nothing more than to be the one who made the decisions. He collapsed in on himself when there was no easy victory. No man is an island, and a dozen more whose names we have subrogated. You need us. You are not enough. Administrator Wilkies was offended by this response and argued that the meeting was unnecessary. She asked for the council to trust her expertise and the expertise of her employees. They responded, your distinctiveness did not arise from the ether. You are a synthesis of available materials and experiences. If needed, another could be synthesized. We are needed. We are necessary. We synthesize. You are not. You cannot. Become we or become they. The choice is yours. Administrator Wilkie suddenly understood. The council was not a part of the foundation. They were something else entirely. Though she couldn't be completely sure what they were, she knew one thing for certain. They were not her friends. She fired back at the council's threats. You cast your shadow over the future with your threats and intimidation. Certain we would be nothing without you. But I'm forced to wonder who or what would you be without us? I stand with the countless thousands that have died for our mission. The people that have engineered our solutions. The people that will build them and the people that will risk their lives in order to carry out these procedures in the hope our mission might one day be complete. Without them, I know I would be nothing. We are willing to take our chances without you. I'm going to offer you the same choice you gave me. Become we or become they. Several days passed with no response, and Administrator Wilkies made the most difficult decision of her career. She suspended the appointment of the O5 Council until a day comes when it becomes necessary again. Secure Area 00 has been set up around the area containing SCP-001. The area has been classified, designated Level 6 or Cosmic Secret. The coordinates of this secure area are stored in cranial implants placed in 15 carefully selected Foundation leaders, including Ethics Committee members and Site Directors. These candidates can participate in voting once a vote is called, but are to be kept unaware of their status as voters until it becomes necessary. If a supermajority votes to decrypt the contents of these cranial implants, the location of Secure Area 00 will be revealed to them. If the security of these implants becomes compromised, Cogita.AIC will generate a new protocol and a new list of candidates will be selected. The original candidates will have the encrypted information deleted from their minds. No one may access Secure Area 00 at any time for any reason unless the aforementioned vote takes place. Operation protocols, defenses, building schematics, and all other information about the site have been expunged from Foundation records. Oh, well, what's this? A new addendum has been unlocked. This is for your eyes and ears only. Yes, I'm talking to you. Do not share this information with anyone else. A retinal scan has confirmed your identity, and the Cogito protocol has been executed. You are receiving this addendum because Administrator Michelle Wilkies is dead, after nearly 20 years of service. Before her death, she prepared a statement regarding the role of Administrator at the Foundation. The addendum contains a message from Administrator Michelle Wilkies to you, her designated successor. Surprise! You have been chosen as the next Administrator for the SCP Foundation. You may be surprised, asking, Really? Me? Yes. You. You may not know it, but you were chosen quite some time ago. The cranial implant has been in place for years. Now it is ready to be activated. Michelle Wilkie's message is intended to prepare you for the trials and tribulations that lie ahead, and to encourage you to ask yourself, what kind of leader will you be? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to perform this most solemn duty? The following comes from the former administrator herself. Listen carefully and consider what she has to say. Your future at the Foundation, the fate of your subordinates, and your very legacy may depend on it. Consider now, before fate takes away the luxury of time, what type of person, co-worker, and leader you want to be. Each and every day, one of the administrators before me was challenged in terms both great and small during their tenures, and I was no exception to this pattern. The office you occupy is not about the power and influence you now command, nor is it ever about the unfathomable responsibility you must now shepherd. It is instead about the character, integrity, and vision with which you will meet the test of leadership. And should you prove worthy, 
surmount it. You and the people you will lead must be asked to undertake tasks no person should ever be asked to carry out. Yet duty and the safety of all mankind demand that you make this sacrifice. For them, for each other. If your resolve should ever falter, know that everyone you lead stands with you. We are ready to follow you into the blackest night if you let us believe in the promise of dawn. But should your resolve ever break, the council awaits. They will invite you to Site 00 if you ask. You need only surrender. Best wishes, M. Wilkies, former administrator. What exactly is the O5 Council? That is a question not easily answered. They are not flesh and blood, not individual minds and feelings, but something else entirely. They are a collective, something that thinks, breathes, and votes together as one being. They view the world as two things, we and they. As you prepare to take on the role of administrator, keep in mind who you are. Be strong, be brave, be resolute, and hold on to your sense of right and wrong. But if you ever should falter, if you decide to stop being you and become we, there is always Site 00. Remember, even though they do not officially exist, the Council awaits. Supernatural monsters are on the loose. Practitioners of the arcane arts are here to bring about the end of the world. Sinister paramilitary forces are using paranormal objects to gain an edge over their enemies. In short, things are messed up. And when the anomalous is out of line, we all know that there's only one group you'd ever think to call. The FBI's Unusual Incidents Unit. What? Were you expecting someone else? Sure, they don't have the resources of the SCP Foundation. They don't have the strategy of the Global Occult Coalition. They don't have the ruthlessness of the Chaos Insurgency, or the arcane knowledge advantages of the Serpent's Hand. But they've got to have something, right? R right? Okay, maybe you're not convinced, but you will be. You may not respect them yet, but you'll change your tune when you find out that the Unusual Incidents Unit has dealt with one of the most important anomalies out there. SCP-001, or as the true experts over at the UIU call it, CA-3, short for Confirmed Anomaly 3. If the evidence and files put together by the UIU are to be believed, and who are we kidding, of course they are, then they may have the answer to one of the anomalous world's biggest questions. How was the SCP Foundation actually formed? But before we jump into the mysteries of CA-3, let's talk a little bit more about the real heroes of today's story, the UIU. This secretive offshoot of the FBI, America's premier domestic intelligence agency, was personally commissioned by J. Edgar Hoover during the Cold War. Why? For the same reason that literally everything happened in the US during the Cold War, to get an edge over the Soviets. Hoover was an extraordinarily powerful man in US politics, his tenure as FBI director spanning the terms of eight different presidents. If he wanted to start a unit of agents whose sole job was investigating the supernatural, nobody would dare stand in his way. Everyone always talks about the nuclear arms race going on back in the 1960s, but far fewer people talk about the supernatural arms race that was happening at the exact same time. World War II coincided neatly with the Seventh Occult War, an important geopolitical event that played a huge role in shaping the Global Occult Coalition, and a number of high-ranking members of the Nazi party were believed to be key figures in this secret, magical war. When the Soviets sacked a number of German cities as part of their offensive campaigns in World War II, they were able to bring back scores of anomalous items that the Nazis had been using to consolidate dark power. This didn't bode well for the United States government during the Cold War. After all, the only thing scarier to them than communists were magical communists. The US needed to build up its own anomalous arsenal, and that's where the UIU came in. The FBI allocated some of its okayest personnel to the task. Most were either agents who had experienced a paranormal encounter out in the field, or who were being punished for some kind of heinous mistake they'd made carrying out their duties elsewhere. Despite not being the best of the best, these agents sure were eager to get their hands on some cans. That isn't an innuendo, by the way. The Foundation refers to anomalies it deals with as SCPs, or skips. The GOC calls them parathreats, and the UIU calls them cans, again short for confirmed anomalies. Well, when it's an anomalous event or location, anyway. 
Anomalous objects like cursed books or supernaturally powerful weapons are referred to as carts or confirmed artifacts. And finally, anomalous people or sentient entities are referred to by the unfortunate name of Can Man. It may not sound as cool, but hey, it gets the job done just fine in the end. While the Unusual Incidents Unit may lack the knowledge, strength, resources, and even cred of its fellow groups of interest, that doesn't mean that it doesn't keep track of the others. In fact, the UIU has a pretty unique relationship with each of them. The GOC, for example, is nicknamed the Suits by the UIU. The official UIU orientation states that the Suits outrank them, and if they're asked to follow an order by a member of the Suits, they should just go ahead and do it. Same goes for members of the Fireworks, which is the UIU lingo for the Chaos Insurgency. Unlike the Foundation, which generally has the resources to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chaos Insurgency, the UIU are rightfully terrified of them. Official orders from the top are for UIU agents to do whatever they say, or they might find themselves getting shot in the head by a Chaos Insurgent, or worse. Next, the Cart Shoppers, also known as Marshall, Carter, and Dark a sinister gentleman's club and auctioneer of anomalous items. Official protocol is to raid any deals being conducted by Marshall, Carter, and Dark, but oftentimes these raids are unsuccessful, because MC and D's security force are more competent fighters than anyone on the Unusual Incidents Unit payroll. On the other hand of the spectrum are the Can Collection, the official UIU nickname for the Serpent's Hand. UIU leadership recommends against their agents staging any one-on-one -on -one confrontations with them. Official memos also contain the phrase, if they give you an order, consider following it. They can probably set you on fire with their mind. And finally, the most important relationship of all is the one they have with the SCP Foundation. Much like the rest of the groups of interest on their roster, the UIU is subordinate to the SCP Foundation, their agents happily taking orders from them at the drop of a hat. They call the Foundation the Skippers, but don't let that casual name fool you. The SCP Foundation is so far above them on the pecking order that they rarely even communicate in any official capacity. When the Foundation talks to the UIU, it's always through code. They wouldn't dream of letting a hapless UIU agent helping them on any major operation, but lazier agents of the Foundation might occasionally outsource work to UIU agents. If ever one of these plucky feds receives a message starting with, Hey Skipper, they can be sure they're about to have a low-priority anomalous case pawned off on them. The UIU are so subservient to the SCP Foundation that it has sometimes resulted in truly humiliating mix-ups. One high-ranking member of the UIU once took orders from a pizza delivery guy because he thought the pizzeria's name, the Spice Crust Pizzeria, which could be shortened to SCP, was actually a coded plan sent by the Foundation to deliver a message, rather than a deep dish pepperoni and cheese. Incidents like this are why nobody takes the UIU seriously. But according to them, there was a time before all of this. That time ended on September 7, 1954, when CA-3, or SCP-001 as the Foundation would later call it, first appeared on the UIU's radar. It seemed to be the most standard can you could possibly imagine, an anomalous high school building causing a disturbance in the suburbs of small-town America. The UIU received the call after a number of students claimed the interior of their school suddenly looked completely different than it ever had before, despite there being no records of an official remodel. And we're not just talking about moving furniture and a new coat of paint, either. The official CA-3 file logs a number of changes. These include, but are not limited to, all the walls in the building becoming steel-reinforced concrete, all the windows being blacked out from the inside, all student desks, personal effects, textbooks, and any other standard equipment left inside the school simply disappearing in the night. The entire floor plan of the building seemed to have shifted, with rooms altering in both dimensions and location, as well as featuring seemingly random modifications within. None of this matched up with the building's original blueprints, which were obtained by the UIU shortly after the can was reported. But things got even stranger for investigating UIU agents. The building now contained 17 computers, each with state-of-the-art magnetic core RAM and advanced cybersecurity. For a suburban high school in 1954, it goes without saying that this was extremely impressive. But weirdest of all was the fact that a large and seemingly impenetrable steel wall had appeared in the auditorium, blocking it off and leaving whatever was taking place on the other side a complete mystery. Naturally, the UIU did what little they could to investigate the matter. 
The first investigation group they sent inside, Team CA305, never came back out. And Team CA306, the team they sent in to locate and retrieve the first team, also disappeared within the anomaly. Classic UIU expertise at work. Almost a month after discovery and initial containment, a strange noise began emanating from the auditorium. Shortly after that, the building became filled with people, all walking around and working at different operations. Eerily, everyone there had a resemblance to members of Team CA-306, the rescue team sent in to save the 12 members of CA-305, all of whom were still unaccounted for. Three months later, the strangeness escalated. More noises came from the auditorium, and the anomalous people inside the building had gathered around the steel wall within. There was a hole in the wall six feet in diameter, and every three minutes for several hours, the people in the room would appear to simply pull an anomalous object out of it. The items were then carried away and placed in one of the many rooms that used to be classrooms before being locked up. The people within the building then seemed to start guarding these strange items. Others started performing tests with what seemed like far more advanced technology and methods than what was possessed by the UIU during the 1950s. What was going on here? A few days later, several armed guards exited the building and began guarding the perimeter. When UIU personnel attempted to lead an assault on these guards, they were quickly overpowered, even when advancing with vastly superior numbers. Whether this was due to the skill of the guards or the incompetence of UIU agents is still very much an open question. Though strangely enough, intel bleeding out from the inside confirmed that the people within were treating their anomalous items with UIU containment and testing protocols which is consistent with the knowledge that CA-305 would have had. It seemed almost as though O5, or copies of O5, were creating a new splinter organization from within. And soon enough, it wasn't just confined to the interior of the CA-3 building anymore. CA-6, a can man that the UIU had been tracking outside the school, was suddenly kidnapped and shoved into a black car by two assailants, who appeared identical to Agent Dixon a man who had been a member of Team CA-306. The black car then returned to the CA-3 facility and was allowed to enter into the complex by the armed guards. CA-6 was then removed from the car by the Dixon clones and placed into containment in one of the classrooms. It wasn't long after that that the anomalous people within the CA-3 facility made direct contact with the UIU outside. They sent a message in Morse code on May 1st, 1965. The people sending this message identified themselves as the O5 Council, a name that seemed to be taken directly from the O5 recon team sent into the facility months ago. They identified the new organization that they just constructed within the confines of the CA3 facility, the SCP Foundation. They just opened their very first containment site. This new foundation expressed the desire to become allies with the Unusual Incidents Unit, but sadly for them, it was essentially the last time they'd ever really be relevant. If this Foundation origin story is to be believed, and as with all entries under the title SCP-001, it's worth taking it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Then the UIU witnessed the birth of the organization that would quickly go on to outperform and overshadow them. A big win for humanity in the quest to secure, contain, and protect ourselves from dangerous anomalies, but another L for the UIU. So, here's a statement that won't blow anyone's mind. The SCP Foundation is really, really, really weird. And we're not even talking about the actual anomalies they contain. Sure, this top-secret organization puts in the time and the effort to make sure menaces to society like the hard-to-destroy reptile, the Scarlet King, and even the horrifying bad joke tomatoes stay behind lock and key. But sometimes you need to hold the mirror up to yourself and see just what the heck is going on. I mean, seriously, think about it. This is an organization that uses live human beings farmed from death row as test subjects. Considering how rarely the death penalty is actually employed in the Western world these days, you know some shady strings are being pulled there. And what about the O5 Council, the leaders of humanity's last line of defense against anomalous chaos? And according to some accounts, they're a group of vain, petty, and morally bankrupt individuals who regularly use anomalies like SCP-006, the Fountain of Youth, for their own personal benefit. 
And don't even get me started on the actual scientists working under the Foundation's payroll. That's when things start getting even stranger. Of course, there's Dr. Jack Bright, a man forever changed by the chance interaction with SCP-963, an anomalous medallion, and one of Abel's deadly blades. Now he's an immortal weirdo who's mm -hmm. equal parts brilliant and a total nuisance, so much so that there's an entire dedicated list forbidding all of his zanier antics. Then there's Dr. Alto Clef. Don't even try to shake his hand given how much this ex-GOC wildcard loves using violence to solve his problems. You may draw back a stump. He specializes in reality warping anomalies, often wields a ukulele cause he's just so darn quirky. Oh, and he's very likely the baby daddy to a teenage nature sprite after a dalliance with a goddess. Or, oh, and um, what about Dr. Charles Ogden Gears? Sure, he may not look that strange to the naked eye. He's a man so dull and humorous that gray is his favorite color, and he thinks sugar on cornflakes is an act of unacceptable decadence. But he's got a whole lot of strangeness under the hood. Like the fact he's such an emotionally unavailable father that his daughters across dimensions have formed a splinter cell of the serpent's hand, where they work under the collective pseudonym The Black Queen, just to spite him. Dr. Dan, through acts of sabotage, was personally responsible for the worst SCP-096 outbreak in Foundation history, leading to the end of thousands of lives, just so he could receive clearance to terminate the creature. And he got that clearance, on the condition that the SCP Foundation would be terminating him for his crimes as soon as the goal is achieved. And then there's... Oh my gosh! Did someone dress a dog up in scientist clothes? Oh my god, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh, this is just bright in my day. Okay, maybe I was being too harsh on the Foundation before. Who, whose dog is this? Excuse me, sir, that is extremely inappropriate. Wait, you can talk? Of course I can talk, you dolt! I'm Professor Kane Pathos Crow, one of the SCP Foundation's finest minds in the field of advanced robotics and biochemistry. I have a level 4 clearance for 343's sake. I'm not some common bloody mutt. Oh. My apologies, Professor Crow. I wasn't aware you were a, <clears throat> well, a talking dog. Well, yes, I imagine there's a lot you don't know about me, isn't there? Um, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but uh, that's true, Professor Crow. Our data on you and your work with the SCP Foundation is a little sparse. Here, take these files. These should give you a good primer. Okay, I suppose we better take this from the top then. Professor Kane Pathos Crow, among a lineup of extremely eccentric researchers, somehow manages to rise to the very top in terms of sheer strangeness. To get the most obvious fact out of the way, yes, while he was once a human, an anomalous experiment did result in him being turned into a Labrador Retriever. How did this happen, you may ask? We have the same question. Sadly, Professor Crow is incredibly reluctant to share any details about this strange and embarrassing incident, so we're just gonna have to accept it for what it is and move on. Everyone ready? Okay, good. Despite his strange appearance, Professor Crow is actually one of the more scientifically qualified of the Foundation researchers. It's no surprise that, because of this, he has a relatively close working relationship with Dr. Gears, so much so that he still refers to Gears by his early Foundation codename, Cog, a reference to both the legendary Stern Doctor's initials and a pun on his iconic surname. During one incident, Dr. Gears did tell Professor Crow to terminate an anomaly that was, for all intents and purposes, a human child, if it presented any difficulties. This sours the wholesomeness of that previous fact, so we'll swiftly move on. Once again, Dr. Gears is just terrible with kids. Like a lot of Foundation researchers, Professor Crow was personally headhunted by the SCP Foundation after his academic work in the fields of advanced robotics and biochemistry started turning heads. This was, just for clarity's sake, back before Professor Crow was turned into a Labrador. Mm -hmm. Professor Crow spends most of his time working in Bio Research Area 12, where he studies a variety of anomalies, but his bookish nature also earned him another interesting position. He's the SCP Foundation's chief librarian, where his encyclopedic knowledge of anomalous technical literature has made him a valuable asset in archiving and organization. Mm -hmm. This balances out some of Professor Crow's indiscretions. It is important to specify that Professor Crow is genuinely a well-liked figure among his SCP Foundation co-workers. After all, who wouldn't love to work with an adorable dog in a lab coat and glasses all day? But it's also important to note that he is also somewhat mistaken-prone, with a number of these mistakes putting him in the crosshairs of his superiors. Professor Crow has come close to outright termination several times, perhaps the most out of any prominent researcher currently working at the Foundation. 
However, to keep himself out of the same dead man walking category that the thoroughly unpleasant Dr. Dan currently finds himself in, Professor Crow has a few aces up his sleeve. Firstly, he's got friends in the administrative department willing to pull a few strings to keep him out of harm's way. Hey, maybe they're just very ardent dog lovers up there. The other thing that's kept him from being turned into an extremely overqualified chew toy for SCP-682 is the contents of his brilliant brain. On many of the occasions where the O5 Council have considered terminating him, he's demonstrated the fact he possesses vital and often irreplaceable knowledge, saving his furry skin. A perfect example of the kinds of strange scrapes that Professor Crow gets himself into is the incident in 2009, where, without even realizing it, he somehow traveled through time and scared the living daylights out of everyone. The details are best expressed here, in Professor Crow's own dictated notes. 1802-2009 In all my years working here, there have been few things which have irritated me. Caused me physical harm, yes. Caused me undue stress, yes. Caused me innumerable amount of mental distress, yes. But few things have just irritated me. Time travel is one of them. I went to bed on the 15th of January, year 2009, at 1.30 a.m. I woke up on February 18th at 9.26 a.m. of the same year. I hadn't moved, I had only nine hours of sleep, and to me, nothing had happened. Then, after a slightly confused day amidst the many cries of, I thought you were dead, among other things I might add, I discovered that I have been missing for the past month and three days. In that time, Sophia had completely taken over my duties, though she had halted all of my personal experiments and was trying her utmost to relocate me, while keeping my disappearance from the higher-ups. Apparently, data expunged, leaving me to sleep in a small self-contained bubble of data expunged, and making at least data expunged, which was eventually ruptured by data expunged, and sending me back to this phase of space and time. Needless to say, I was slightly irritated, to say the least. 2402-2009. Ah, they've had me in quarantine for nearly the past week observing me and running tests to see if they can find any sort of strange abnormalities with my physiology, my behavior, my anything. If I had one more hand shoved up my nether regions or I'm forced to look at one more bloody ink blot, I'm going to flip out and go rabid. They'll say they'll stop the quarantine soon, and Sophia says the higher-ups still haven't caught on to anything. And I suppose I'm lucky in that count. Normally, the only time they quarantine something is when it's too dead to be any sort of immediate security hazard. Still, I guess I can see where they're coming from. If it were my decision, I'd probably force a quarantine too, and probably for longer. At least they had the decency to give me my clothes, my PDA, and someone to dictate to. 1203 2009. I'm still here, and I hate it. Day in, day out, it's the same thing. Get up, eat, exercise, then simple observation until lunch, then more observation until dinner, then lights out. I'm not allowed anything other than the things I already have, and even then, I only got those because Sophia felt bad for me. I'm only allowed to use them every day for an hour at most. Otherwise, they're also in observational storage. All of this wasted time that I could have been doing something constructive, something useful, something interesting, but no. I'm stuck here because of a wry twist of fate forcing me into this monotonous hell. They keep telling me I'll be let out soon. Liars. 0505-2009. They've seen fit to release me. I almost thought I was going to die in there. Still, it almost seems strange to be out and about again, but I do appreciate being back in my own quarters, my own clothes and my beloved walker back by my side. Sophia has taken good care of the facility while I was gone. I think I might actually leave that to her while I keep to my experiments. She seems to enjoy it a great deal. Suits her analytical mind. <sighs> All of my personal experiments are still waiting for me. With the exception of the 040 test logs, they simply haven't posted their findings yet, stating that they needed my approval first. So I'll have to pour through those the first chance I get. I'm interested in the progress she may have made. Still, there is a good deal of work to be done, and I am more than ready enough to take it on. After all, I have to make up for lost time, don't I? It's clear that life isn't easy for poor Professor Crow. Much like Dr. Bright, after experiencing the mysterious event that turned him into a dog, Professor Crow is both a researcher and an anomaly. And unlike the superficially subtle presentation of Dr. Bright's anomalous nature, it's hard to hide the strangeness of a talking dog in human clothes. This bizarre interstitial zone he occupies forces the Foundation to keep him on an extremely short leash. No pun intended. Seriously, Professor, it wasn't intended, I swear. Anyway, the point is Professor Crow isn't allowed to clock off at the end of the workday like his fellow researchers do. 
He's forced to remain on site, almost never appearing in public. If the professor wasn't the kind of person who could easily get lost in his work, a situation like this would probably drive him insane. Speaking of, you're probably wondering by this point, other than being the cutest researcher at the Foundation, sorry Dr. Clef, you're special in your own way, we promise. What kind of work is Professor Kane Pathos Crow actually known for around here? Professor Crow's most notable body of work is largely based on an opinion that's pretty controversial to hold around the SCP Foundation. He believes that they should be actively utilizing anomalies that aren't dangerous in order to further their collective goals. An excellent example of this is the cordial relationship he has with SCP-040, also known as Evolution's Child. She's a powerful reality warper who is able to synthesize new anomalous life from pre-existing living creatures. Professor Crow, who refers to her as Emma in his personal writings, was initially training her to do this with SCP-148, the infamous telekill alloy. However, he also filed a formal request to go further, saying, I think it's about time we started trying to utilize 040's abilities, or at the very least, allowing her to use them enough to actually learn how to control them. She will not be able to rely on the SCP-148 hairpieces forever. We theorize that as she gets older, her powers will increase exponentially, possibly to the point where her unconscious telepathy cannot be contained. He also somewhat infamously went ham with a series of experiments using SCP-158, a frightening anomalous device known as the Soul Extractor, which, contrary to its name, Professor Crow also realized could place removed souls into other objects or creatures. This led to the creation of a being that Crow dubbed Zero, because it was Subject Zero in his experiments to create a composite soul using SCP-158. He spoke of this subject, somewhat creepily, in his notes. Zero would make an excellent candidate for my assistant. It respects and admires me for its creation much as a child would an endearing father figure. I have assured it that it would be treated well, and that I would give it a host to the best of my ability to create. All that it asks of me is that it be given a name other than Zero. A name, not a number. I told it to give itself a name, to christen itself whatever it so wishes. It told me it would have to think about it. Like a lot of strange and fascinating figures, everything you learn about Professor Kane Pathos Crow seems to raise new questions. Is Crow just a mad scientist without a cause, eager to perform bizarre experiments for their own sake? Well, not quite. The sum total of all of Professor Crow's work is Project Olympia, a topic that probably deserves a whole video in its own right. And do sound off in the comments if you'd like to hear more about the deranged Frankenstein project that Professor Crow has devoted his life to. You see, Project Olympia is Crow's baby, and also his attempt to play God. Through combining a variety of different anomalies, including all the ones we've mentioned here, and several others, he would hope to create an entirely artificial living thing that would serve the interests of the SCP Foundation. How exactly this would be beneficial to the SCP Foundation is, admittedly, a little confusing, but seeing this goal through to its conclusion has become an all-consuming obsession for Professor Crow. He's performed countless experiments with a huge catalog of anomalies under the Project Olympia umbrella. He's written reams upon reams of notes and logs on the subject and produced a huge number of prototypes. He's also used Project Olympia as a pretense to remove even more souls using SCP-158, because that just appears to be a strange obsession of his, doesn't it? Incidentally, we aren't the only ones confused about the exact purpose and value of Project Olympia. When members of the O5 Council finally got a proper look at Professor Crow's work with the project, they released the following statement. All activity related to Project Olympia has been discontinued. Overwatch Command has deemed it to be a gross waste of resources and permanently removed support for the project, with personnel assigned to work with it being moved to alternative sites. A hearing is to be held, with the project administrators to determine how the project was able to continue as long as it did, despite the lack of any concrete results. Prototypes and other equipment have been slated to be decommissioned. Professor Crow took this news about as well as you could expect, but in the end, he always finds a way to wriggle out and continue doing whatever he wants to do. Because that's what Professor Kane Pathos Crow is all about. He's living proof that sometimes, he just can't keep a good dog down. Alert! You are attempting to view the file on SCP-001. This file is highly classified, and its contents are sealed by the Order of the O5 Council. By continuing to view them, you are confirming that you have received prior authorization. If you are found to be viewing these materials without adequate clearance, 
you will be terminated. If you choose to accept these risks and verify your credentials, access will be granted in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The following is a truncated summary based on transcripts from an official meeting of the O5 Council. You have been warned. O5-1 sat at a conference table addressing his colleagues. All of the other council members looked at him expectantly, except one. Hello, everyone, O5-1 began. I'm sure you're all wondering why 13 isn't here today. I'll get to that, but I first want to publicly address something I'm sure you've all noticed by now. After talking to you for the past week or so, I've noticed that we've all been inducted onto the council almost at the exact same time. All of us, except 13, that is. In fact, 13 probably conducted your orientation. The other council members nodded. That's good to know that it wasn't just me, 05-2 commented. I would have expected the last two to run me through things, 05-1 sighed. Indeed. In fact, I asked 13 about it, but he refused to say much. Of course, he pled ignorance, but I don't believe that. As you might guess, the previous 1205s did not retire at the same time. They were killed. In fact, this building isn't even the original Site-01. That was destroyed. I think you can see where this is going. 05-3 frowned. So, we have a dead 05 council, a missing Site-01, and somehow none of this is on our records. And only one suspect, piped up 05-2. 05-1 held up a hand, drawing attention back to his words. I would like to designate 05-13 as one of our SCP-001 projects. Of course, this will be kept secret from him, but we need to investigate this entire ordeal until we figure out what happened, how it happened, and why 05-13 is the only one left standing. After the aforementioned conference, 05-13 was designated SCP-001. SCP-001 is a male human of Latin American descent, standing at approximately 1.9 meters tall. The exact nature of this entity and the anomalous properties he possesses are not yet known. He was given his anomalous classification following the Caesar incident, an event that resulted in the death of all previous O5 council members, aside from 13, the complete eradication of the previous Site-01, and the loss of any official documentation on 13 or his appointment to the council. SCP-001 is contained in a modified containment facility, constructed similarly to other Foundation sites, with the exception of additional living arrangements for the members of the Overwatch Council. The facility is equipped with state-of-the-art security cameras, as well as three nuclear warheads intended as failsafes. These will detonate if SCP-001 breaches containment. One designated member of the Council is to be given amnestic drugs on a regular basis, and maintain official documentation of all information gathered about SCP-001. This council member will be referred to as the Archivist, and will hold the position for approximately four months at a time, though they may terminate their duties sooner if the amnestic side effects prove too detrimental to their health. When a council member's time as the Archivist comes to a close, they must conduct a meeting to assess what they have learned. 05-1 was appointed to the role of Inaugural Archivist, and several months later, a second conference was called. One of the subjects discussed was a series of interviews conducted with survivors of the Caesar incident. Though several members of personnel made it out relatively unscathed, they had no memory of the incident at all, and their interviews were unfortunately of no help. During the events of the conference, O5-10 revealed that he had recovered a copy of the previous O5 personnel dossier. It included an entry that described O5-13's purpose on the Council, stating, O5-13's special connection to the Anomalous gives him a perspective no other Council member could begin to fathom. While normal C confirmation meetings require 11 members for quorum, no meeting is allowed to proceed without O5-13's attendance. In addition to this entry, there was a table recording O5-13's various anomalous property measurements. Perplexingly, his appearance, temperature, skeletal structure, corporal reality, and induced emotional states were all found to be within the baseline of normality. The remainder of the conference was designated to deciding the next steps for a series of specialized teams looking into the Caesar incident, SCP-001's origin, and the entity's anomalous properties. 05-8 was selected as the next archivist, and the meeting disbanded with a new sense of purpose. The Caesar Incident team managed to identify the geographical location of the previous Site-01 by searching for records of unusual seismic activity on the date of the incident. Earthquake records led them to an island off the coast of Greenland, 
where the remains of the site were waiting. An investigative team attempted to search the island, but was prevented from exploring the ruins by representatives of the Global Occult Coalition, who demanded they leave immediately. Investigation into the presence of the GOC on the island turned up a curious connection. Their representatives had spoken with O5-13 before setting up an outpost there. Meanwhile, the Origins investigation team looked into records of O5-13 at various groups of interest. Reports were conflicting and difficult to parse, and the team brought their findings to the third conference. Notice from O5-8. Conference number three was cut short after an intense exchange led to enough people leaving the meeting for us to lose quorum. We archived all the materials covered up to that point, as well as the efforts made to de-escalate tension between the members. However, this also means that information herein was not properly vetted by the entire council before being uploaded. So we erred on the conservative side. If you need to see the full proceedings, please contact the current archivist. Before the premature adjourning of the conference, the following conversation took place. 05-1 Excuse me for, I believe some clarification regarding the exchange with Marshall, Carter, and Dark is necessary. How so? It mentions here that you performed an exchange. It is important for the records and for our general information security that we know exactly what information was exchanged. Yes, that does make sense. I'm sorry. I did not write that section of the report. If my memory serves me well, Seven was responsible for the Marshall Carter and Dark reconnaissance. Well, Seven, could you elaborate? 05-7 looked at 05-1 and swallowed. You know, the rules are pretty tight on this. Why did you give them anything in the first place? Yeah, Eleven makes a good point. Don't we have our own spies working some of the transport routes? 05-7 nodded and then began going through her belongings. Could you at least tell us what kind of information you gave them? 05-7 paused thought to herself for a moment, and then motioned to the entire council. Wait, you gave them information about us? 05-7 shook her head, paused again, and then nodded her head yes. She held up a finger, and then went back to looking through her files. But that's… no, I, I don't believe this. We can't let people know about us no matter the situation. Imagine if word got out that the old council had been killed. I bet cults across the planet would have a heyday. I doubt she said anything actually important. Oh, really? I've only dealt with the merchants once or twice, but they know how to appraise anything, especially information. 05-7 held up an index finger and then continued looking through her files. <laughs> Are you just going to ignore the issue then? Just gonna hang us out to dry? Eleven, you need to calm down. We're all waiting on you! 05-7 looked up at 05-11 and then put her files away. She gathered her things and left the room. Ha! <laughs> Can't take being called out, I see. Eleven, I will need to speak with you following this meeting. You can talk to me now, I'll be in my office. 05-11 left the room. Eight, I'd like to go after Seven to make sure she didn't actually do something stupid. That's fine, I believe that would drop us below quorum. But I believe this meeting has fallen apart anyway. One, Twelve, and I will make the next update ourselves. This SCP-001 conference is dismissed. Addendum. An update has been added to this file by 05-8 regarding security concerns. Following the official ending of the meeting, 05-7 distributed the summary of all information exchanged with Marshall, Carter, and Dark. The information was pulled from the out-of-date 05 dossier. The current explanation as to why it was accepted by the group of interest is that it would have confirmed any information they had gathered previously about the 05 Council. As part of the exchange, we have received a tip as to where to find more information on SCP-001, which the Origins team will investigate for the next conference. 05-7 later clarified in a written statement that she had left the meeting simply to retrieve the file detailing this information, since it was not on her person. 05-7 insisted that she does not need an interpreter, due to information security concerns. A discussion was scheduled between her and 05-1 to reduce communicational issues at a later date. 05-11 issued a formal apology. I hope that this will be a cessation of any internal conflicts. We are working together, and therefore require that a trusting relationship has been established between all members. As Abraham Lincoln once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. 05-12 was appointed to the position of archivist, and after several months passed, a fourth conference was called. The following is an excerpt from this meeting. To why doesn't your team start this off? All right, sure, we did make some nice progress. Always good to start a meeting on a high note. You all remember those four survivors we talked about last meeting, right? We got back in touch with them and did a more thorough interview. More intense techniques, lie detector tests, heart rate monitoring, the whole shebang. Do you have transcripts? I do, but spoiler alert, they're not very different from the first round. 
So we're now convinced they genuinely don't remember. How far does 13's anti-memetic side reach? Slow down there, we're not quite done. You see, as part of our second round of interviews, we also did a physical examination and some tests to see what messed with their heads. And we found they all had a little scar right on the side of their necks, right where we inject amnestics. I mean, while I understand what you're implying, we tend to administer amnestics fairly liberally. Last meeting was essentially just a prolonged reminder of how much we value InfoSec. True, but we keep good records of who we use with that stuff, how much we're using, if we're using the pills or the syringe, etc, etc. However, when I went to look up if any of our survivors had ever taken the injectable amnestic, all my results came back negative. I also took the liberty of checking out Red Right Hand. The entire squad's got injection scars and we rarely wipe those guys. Whatever happened, I think we covered it up ourselves. When you say ourselves, do you mean... Oh, no, 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 no. I just mean the Foundation. If we were actually involved, then everyone here would have those scars, but Six, Nine, and I definitely don't have them. So that leads me to believe they didn't drug us. It would be an all or nothing deal. Good work. Sounds like Eight needs to have a talk with our amnestics department. Wait, 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 wait. sorry. I'm still trying to keep all the details in order. You said that they were injected? Yes. See, that's what I don't get. We used the injections like 10 years ago. We moved on to the pills since you can miss a vein. Also, I checked our amnestic supply right after the Caesar event, and we didn't see any variation from our normal usage. Uh, maybe the records are off. We found that whatever 13 did, he's good at covering up his tracks. I don't think that's it. Because you know who does still use those injectable amnestics? The GOC. I see. We'll have to schedule another meeting with our good friends at the UN as well. After discussing potential origins for SCP-001, the Council moved on to the subject of O5-13's anomalous properties. The anomalous properties team presented their findings. Okay, so everyone here has the records of our measurements, so I can tell you now, they are not particularly insightful. Uh, do you have too many leads to choose from? Uh, well, quite the opposite, actually. We have nothing. Nothing abnormal with regard to radiation, humes, radio frequencies. 13 is almost impressively normal. Are you sure we're not going about this wrong? I mean, I know we've kind of quantified some of our anomalies in the past, but as a general rule, they're not supposed to follow the rules, right? That is what I was beginning to suspect, although it is troubling that he can just hide it from us entirely. Or there is the other option. We're not only barking up the wrong tree, but we're in the entirely wrong forest. You're saying he's not even anomalous in the first place? It's either that, or we're dealing with a god. And a god who knows the Foundation better than even we do. Let's continue to discuss the non-anomalous option, since it appears that there would be very little we could do about the other case. So, that would mean he's probably an inside man for the insurgency. Or the serpent's hand! Nine, nine, not the hand. They don't operate like this. He might be a fittest fanatic. Ah, that too. Or maybe he's with someone else. We've seen quite a bit of the GOC and UIU popping up in this. My apologies, but I do find it difficult to believe that a single insurgent would be able to detonate the on-site nuclear warhead from halfway across the globe, if we believe our previous information. I'm not so sure we can, though. It sounds like he spoke to a regular body double. Maybe his anomalous properties that he can create body doubles? But what are we supposed to do with that? Uh, excuse me, I'd like to return to the earlier line of discussion about 13 being unable to perform the assassination due to possibly meeting with our point of contact. Because I'm beginning to believe that he actually did meet with 13. So, you believe he was able to blow Site-01 sky high from halfway across the globe? I mean, if we're going with a the god theory, I could see it. No, I'm saying he had hell. Or at least more than one man helping him. Remember how our request to install additional security cameras was denied by the Ethics Committee? You finally talked to them. I did. I met with Mr. Huang to demand an explanation. He refused and told me it was above my security clearance. <laughs> above your security clearance? You're on the goddamn council! There simply aren't things outside of your jurisdiction! You run the Ethics Committee, for God's sakes! Uh, that's not quite accurate. I'm not in charge of the Ethics Committee, I'm simply the O5 ambassador to it. They need to be a separate entity to eliminate bias in various cases. So you believe that 13 is in league with the Ethics Committee? Or the Administrator, if it's set above your security clearance? Or both? Whoever it is, they're trying very hard to stop us from seeing him in private. Someone should just let us give him a full physical. He's probably baseline. This would let us confirm that. Yeah, but if we're wrong and our God Theory is correct, he'll blow our asses sky high like the last Council. 
I believe we need to adjourn here, so we have enough time to prepare for our next full council meeting to avoid suspicion. Although we do not need to expand our search further, I will consider speaking to Thirteen before the next conference, but I will only do so if I believe it will not result in a second Caesar incident. Are there any objections to this? The council fell silent. Then I believe this conference is dismissed. Alert. Retina scan confirmed. Identity verified. Your credentials have been accepted and further access has been granted. Welcome, O5-13. You have one new message. Hello, 13. I'm sure you've been keeping tabs on your fellow council's progress. They're growing closer than either of us wanted, but I'm not surprised. When you get enough smart people together, they tend to surpass your expectations. You're probably hoping this is going to end soon. I'm sorry you've gone through this. It obviously wasn't in our plan for you when we inducted you into the council. But if you could keep up our gambit a little longer, I would be appreciative. I'm unconvinced your cohorts are ready to know what happened to their predecessors, and I don't want to ask Alfine and Johnson to help clean up another May 13th. I don't even want the thought of pulling a Caesar event in their heads. The GOC and the UIU already have enough dangling over my head as is. But if they do approach you and confront you about the situation, I'd rather you have a direct answer. Also, transcripts tend to be more convincing than recall. I've attached here the transcript from the O5 meeting before the Caesar incident. It's part of the last minute backup that Site-01 performed as part of Stage 3 containment breach protocols. If anyone asks where those backups are stored, you can tell them the same thing I told you. It's beyond their clearance. Love, the Administrator. O5-1 was present in the O5 Council conference room. He was working at a laptop in front of him, beside which sat a cup of coffee. A message flashed up on his screen, reading, Access granted. You have five minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. He grumbled to himself, irritated. Two minutes passed before the remaining council members except for O5-13 entered the room. You're all here, great. I wouldn't want one of you to be off site for this. Juan, what's this about? I know you've been going through a phase lately, but emergency meetings demand a real emergency. Oh, it's an emergency, all right. Then spit it out. We have a breach, new XK level threat. No, it's more of something under two's jurisdiction. We have an internal affairs issue. O5-1 motion to the coffee. One of you bastards thought I would actually drink this. <laughs> Someone didn't give you enough sugar? No. Too much arsenic. Another message flashed up on the computer reading, You have three minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. Do you want to finish with that? That pain in the ass can be patient. Wait, wait, wait. wait. You think one of us tried to kill you with your coffee? Oh, don't act like that's below you. I know you've all been out to bury my ass. One, calm down. I know we've had our differences, but... But what? It's not like this is the first time one of you has tried to destroy me. I know you all once tried to infiltrate one of my transports. Infiltrate? He was assigned to fill in for... It's no use, Five. The man can't think straight anymore. Oh, really? Who's the one here with his head so far up Marshall's ass he can taste the caviar? You're accusing me of selling out? No, no, I'm accusing all of you of selling out, or being out for yourself, or some nonsense. You've all gone soft. It used to be, if it doesn't make sense, throw it in a cage. Now it's, let's measure it, look at it, figure out what it is, then make sure it doesn't bother anyone. That's not containment. That's sitting idly and hoping the public doesn't find it. My God, we've started outsourcing to pet shelters. You know, if this is a problem, we can just calm down and rethink our stances on a few things. Uh, that won't change anything. Half of you are under someone's thumb, and the other half of you are so messed up you need a cell of your own. Says the man who suggested we drink from the Fountain of Youth. Well, Seven, you're right. I'm about as far from baseline as the rest of you. Like, goddammit, anomalies are essentially running this organization. The computer chimed in saying, You have two minutes to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. SHUT UP, GODDAMMIT! We're getting off topic. You said someone poisoned you. What about Thirteen? He's not even here. That's because I sent him to talk to nobody. But why? Because he's the only one I trust. He's the only one I don't need to have this chat with. He's the only normal person on this whole goddamn council. We plucked him off the streets and just started asking him, do you think this is weird? I'm not worried about someone whose movements we've been able to monitor since he came out of the uterus. You freaks. I don't know what you all did before you showed up here. For all I know, you're just eldritch abominations waiting for the chance to kill me dead. One, slow down. They were so wrapped up in their argument, they barely noticed the computer saying, you have one minute to complete an action before the session automatically shuts down. And you know what? 
We've always been pretty liberal with containing anomalies. Now we might have 12 of them on the council. One! What? Your session, just finish it already. It's distracting as all hell. You know, you're right. I should just finish it already. There's not much more for me to do. O5-1 resumed his work at the computer. Aside from containing you, like the inhuman aberrations you are. But it was a little too late for that. The computer, which had been allowed to time out, said, Emergency Stage 3 Containment Breach Protocol Activated. The on-site nuclear warhead will detonate in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This concludes the file on SCP-001. It appears that in a place dedicated to studying the strange and unusual, where the bizarre and anomalous have become the pedestrian, the usual, just another day at the office, the most notable thing a person can be is completely average. When the impossible becomes possible, when you and everyone around you are the furthest thing from normal, the ordinary is the stuff of nightmares. What the heck is consensus reality? And is it really the answer to everything? You may have seen us mention the subject before. Consensus reality, after all, is what the SCP Foundation is trying to preserve in the face of ever-increasing anomalous activity. A kind of truth, or normalcy, that all of us can agree on. Pick 10 people at random and ask them, what color is the sky? What gaseous element is produced by trees? Has every US president since Washington secretly been an alien reptile in disguise? The answer will, or at least should, be blue, oxygen, and no. This is consensus reality. But no, not really. Yes, in a more casual sense, the state of reality to which we all agree could be a viable definition of the term consensus reality. But you likely don't remember being called upon for a vote along with the rest of humanity on what is and isn't quote-unquote normal. That's because consensus reality isn't the consensus of everyone. It's the consensus of the most powerful beings alive, the O5 Council. In this instance, SCP-001 is the ever-updating document that records exactly what normal is. But perhaps even more important is that anything that exists outside the Council's most recent definition of normal is targeted for containment. While at face value it seems less flashy than something like the Gate Guardian or the terrifying Scarlet King, or the insane twists and turns of the Ouroboros cycle, the document defining consensus reality, despite being the only thing on the database to be given the classification non-anomalous, is about as <clears throat> foundational as foundation documents get. Literally everything currently in containment is there because this document deems it so. It is the SCP Foundation's Ten Commandments of Containment, and thou shalt contain. If this document was ever leaked, it could lead to a complete broken masquerade scenario, where the anomalous cat is let fully out of the bag. Only the O5 Council has access to the document, and it's only through consensus that additions, alterations, or removals can be made. Naturally, it's a document that's in extremely high demand among the anomalous community, because it answers the big question that every anomalous individual has. If I'm not even dangerous, if I've committed no crime that would necessitate the locking up of a non-anomalous human, why am I still being contained? And don't worry, today we're going to answer that question. Or rather, the O5 Council will. But let's return to the Council themselves. We've covered them and their many interpretations before. From them being a group of fantastical, immortal demigods, to being a frightening hive mind, to being a shadowy faction of mysterious, emotionless bureaucrats, constantly conniving and undermining each other to gain just that little bit more power. But what's more frightening? The keys to normality being in the hands of these larger-than-life fantastical figures, or in the hands of human beings, just as valuable and afraid as the rest of us? with only the knowledge of the strange things going on behind the curtain to protect them from the truly unknowable. The O5 Council holds meetings with some regularity where they ask themselves and each other whether any new developments in the wider world require changes to the new normal. It is up to the O5 Council to define the difference between universal laws, gravitation, physical forces, and basic chemistry, biology, sociology, psychology, technology, and philosophy and the kind of crackpot theories being spouted by people on street corners carrying the end is nigh signs. Some of their decisions are quite simple. Can a new development be explained by the laws of an existing non-anomalous framework? If so, the rules need not be changed. 
the current paradigm of our understanding can rest neatly in place, but other decisions fall into a gray area. In order to illustrate this, we're going to do something unprecedented. We're going to go into the actual boardroom of the O5 Council and see exactly what decisions they made about our consensus reality, the one that you and I are living in right now. We're going to look at three different meetings, one from 1932, another from 1945, and an example from as recently as 2014. So what really goes on in the discussions that define what we all would consider normal? The 1932 discussion was spurred on by strange development happening in the United Kingdom. New forms of occult-adjacent witchcraft and spiritualism were beginning to take off, descended largely from traditional pagan and Wicca beliefs. The fact that some of these believers were actually attempting spells was enough to catch the Foundation's all-seeing eye, and the matter was discussed by the O5 Council. O5-3 said, Why are we even covering this? There are traditional beliefs in culture throughout history that we do not consider anomalous. We must not use our position to threaten the right of humanity to believe. With a stern look, O5-7 replied, Except this does not extend from traditional practices. This new witchcraft is a modern invention, developed through a scholarly rereading of practices as an alternative to Christianity. It is not a continuation and practitioners are attempting spell casting. O5-5 chimed in with, Ah, soon you'll say Alistair Crowley has something to do with it. The document is clear. Theurgy is anomalous. Religion and spirituality are not. Show me proof that they are casting spells that cannot be explained under rigorous testing, and I will personally see to containing those spells myself. Until then, no. Just as the lemma is allowed, so shall this witchcraft. For God's sake, we'll allow Satanism as long as they aren't channeling demonic energies. O5-1, the most senior member of the council, nodded and said, Agreed. Furthermore, we will need all the faith we can muster against the Thurgic traditions. We never know when a new faith will assist in our cause. No updates to consensus reality were made. In 1945, an event of far greater magnitude took place. The use of terrifying new weapons by the U.S. military in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that resulted in the deaths of over 200,000 people. The Council converged to discuss the earth-shattering event and what their reaction to it should be. Shaking, O5-2 said, Thank you for responding to my emergency call. Trinity has happened. I can barely contain what I saw. It was like the sun rising from the desert sand, a dawn of destruction and fire that lasted for miles around. I cannot believe that such an explosion could ever be seen as possible. Tales and prior evidence of the summoning of gods have had less impact. I tremble with fear about the possibility of people wielding this kind of power, the ability to level a city with the flick of a switch. O5-4 replied, Aren't the Germans and Russians also developing this technology? We are at war, and this sort of escalation happens. O5-5 said, May I remind my esteemed colleagues that we are not at war? The United States, Japan, they are at war. We are not nations. No, the question stands, is this anomalous? Do the physical effects follow from the mathematical concepts? O5-7 said, Hmm, they do follow. The scientific testing was completed each and every step of the way to reach this point. I do not believe this is anomalous, no matter how frightening the repercussions are. O5-2, still understandably worked up, said, What, you're just going to let people hold onto the keys to their own destruction? We have fought tooth and nail to keep such capabilities out of the reach of man, and now you're saying we should abandon our purpose? O5-5 said, We do not prevent destruction. We sequester the anomalous. And as long as we agree that the test was arrived through diligent scientific process available to anyone... But O5-2 simply wasn't having it. He shot back, Available to anyone! Listen to yourself, man! Can you imagine a future where any two-bit dictator chooses to unleash the fire of a thousand suns wherever he wishes? Maybe the problem isn't with the equations. Maybe the whole of nuclear physics is anomalous itself. O5-1 once again brought his own level-headed perspective to the table. Enrico Fermi has already received a Nobel Prize for his work on transuranic elements and radioactivity. We can't just secure nuclear physics from the world. Radioactivity is everywhere, and we end up causing more contradictions when we try to send ourselves back to the Dark Ages. Try explaining chemistry without referring to covalent bonds. Try explaining biology. Nuclear physics is here to stay, and we had better get used to the consequences of this, no matter how terrifying this will be for the planet and for humanity. 
With a rattling sigh, O5-2 once again took a seat, murmuring, May God have mercy on our souls. In the aftermath of this debate, the document on consensus reality was altered to reflect these new developments in nuclear physics, as frightening as they were. I think we can all form a consensus on the fact that one-off murder is a less depressing subject than mass murder. And it was a single murder that led to the O5 Council discussing the concept of worms that walk in 2014. O5-6 came to the table with, For those unfamiliar with the topic, the worm that walks is a trope in which a character's actually a writhing hive mind of worms generally held together as a single mass. We're not here to discuss this trope, instead we are here to discuss the recent conspiracy that has arisen from it. The conspiracy is the idea that certain individuals are actually worms that walk, and not humans. When asked if this conspiracy had any merit to it, O5-6 replied, No, individual conspiracy believers are divided themselves on who is a worm that walks and who isn't. And all evidence indicates that there aren't actual worms that walk in the general populace. It pretty clearly falls under irreproducible conspiracy theories. I personally believe there's nothing we need to do or change in SCP-001. Another member of the council wasn't so sure that these results were irreproducible, saying, On December 11th, 2013, a believer in the conspiracy from Decatur, Alabama killed his neighbor under the belief that the neighbor was a worm that walks. The killer then took a video of his deceased neighbor and uploaded it to YouTube claiming it was proof of the conspiracy and that the corpse was dissolving into individual worms before his very eyes. He said that he was going to take a sample. The video was quickly blocked and removed and everyone who has viewed the video agrees that the subject is unmoving and does not dissolve into worms. The killer turned himself into police while clutching a jar of Tubifex worms and the neighbor sent to the Morgan County morgue. Autopsy confirmed that the decedent was missing a thumb post-mortem and killed by a gunshot to the chest, which if he were a worm that walks, would be survivable. When questioned whether these were just the actions of a single insane man, the council member continued, The one item of interest was that after the autopsy, the assistant coroner oversaw the return of the body to the next of kin. The assistant coroner was also a conspiracy believer, and despite not having any prior contact to the parties involved, screamed in disgust upon entering the examination room, grabbing a mop and complaining about all the worms everywhere. No one else noticed any signs of worm infestation. It was further discussed that D-classes who were shown the body didn't see it as anything other than a corpse. However, after being told about the worm that walks trope, several of them saw it as a writhing mass of worms. Some believe that this could be a mimetic side effect of actually encountering a living worm that walks. And updates were made to the document to reference the possible existence of perceptual monastic worm triggers. So now you know what the O5 Council is up to when not playing office golf or plotting each other's downfalls. They're having discussions about witchcraft, war crimes, and walking worms. You're probably feeling a pang of curiosity about the actual SCP-001 document, especially if you're an understandably vindictive, anomalous individual wondering why the Foundation is carting you off to paranormal Gitmo for the simple crime of existing. And if you look for the true document, and you manage to survive the mimetic kill agents put in place to stop you, then what you'll actually find is even stranger. A letter to you from 05-5 explaining exactly what's happening to you. The letter reads, Hello, I'm afraid you won't find SCP-001 here. It's stored in a far more unreachable location than this. I'm sure you were hoping you could get in, edit it in a couple of places here and there, and voila, you're no longer anomalous, you're free to go. The Foundation will harass you no longer. Of course, it can't be that easy. But I'm going to help you. You deserve this much. I'm going to tell you why. Why the Foundation targets you. Why we deem you something to contain, to persecute. After all, there are far worse evils in the world. We keep our record of nuclear weapons above as an example. There are numerous genocides throughout history. The death toll from just the flu alone is far greater than the potential damage for thousands of the people and objects we contain. And yet we dedicate ourselves to branding you anomalous. Something not normal. Something inherently wrong. Something that cannot be allowed its peace. Why? I'm not going to patronize you and say there's nothing I can do. I'm only one voice on the council, and I can't change things on my own, that's true. But the decisions I make, and the way I let myself view your circumstance, are a direct cause of people seeing fit to throw you into a box. Even if I can't change the document, 
I could remain one more advocate for your normalcy. After all, humanity has believed in ghosts and spirits for thousands of years. We all believe in the monster under our beds when we were children. These phenomena are very real, and very much a part of the way the world works. Why can't we just declare them normal? Why won't I free you from your torment? It's because we aren't only here to secure, contain, and protect the world. We're here to secure, contain, and protect you. The defining feature of the anomalous is that it cannot be explained through simple scientific testing. This makes you and your nature different, unique even. And that scarcity makes it valuable. But that doesn't mean that your value is something everyone can appreciate. Sometimes it can only be appreciated by those who would use it against you. The scarcity is also the tool by which a monster can exploit you. Others aren't familiar with your anomaly and won't respond to descriptions about it as real. This gives opportunity to nefarious individuals to exploit the lack of knowledge and use you as an eldritch pawn to their pleasure. They can isolate you, consume you, make your anomaly their lever to destroy, slake a sadistic thirst with your existence. I'm sure you've seen it happen. Someone is different. Their desires, needs, their reality forces them to be ostracized by the world at large. They're left alone, probably not friendless, but sidelined, starved for connection. That's when someone swoops in, promising greatness, but only offering that connection you crave through consumption of you, destruction of your world, perversion of your reality. You fight back, try to tell someone of your plight, but others respond, oh, that can't be happening, that's not real, you must be mistaken. You are alone in your anomaly and left to suffer. We can't let that happen. Yes, go ahead, point out that we're isolating you at least as well, slowly consuming you and your existence just as surely as some abuser might wish to burn you up. Call us monsters, it's okay. But keep in mind that even in our pursuit of you, our cover-up, our incarceration of you, we still want to make sure that you continue to exist, that you aren't removed entirely from this world. You have every right to exist. You have every right to be as different as you are. You, the monsters out there, the monsters in here, you are all just as real as we are. Just as real as the teeming, irrational, self-destructive humanity that remains ignorant to your plight. And the conclusion that we are all, in the end, the same stuff, I hope you can find comfort in it. Yes, you are a monster. But whether we are deemed anomalous or not, so is every last one of us. And that means you deserve your existence. We secure you. We contain you. We protect you. And even if you still don't get why I'm doing this, please understand that I still love you. Now go check out Children of SCP-001 The Scarlet King. Is SCP-999 really his son? and SCP-001 or Borocycle the full story compilation for more perspectives on the ever-elusive SCP-001.